Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope you had a good lunch. So we're going to have a wonderful afternoon celebration of the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Program, 20th years of combating cancer prevention and control or improving cancer convention, pre prevention excuse me, and control. So we're really grateful to have our host and our facilitator uh, today. We're really, really exciting. I, I believe he's going to shake you guys up and going to be very, very interactive. So when I met Mr. Fred Blackenship, I said to him, how do you want me to introduce you? What format would you like me to use? And he said, he wakes up very early in the morning, extremely early in the morning. He has three beautiful children, an amazing wife. He truly enjoys life. And he has the dream job in that order. So I said, well, what about all of these other, other um, successes and accomplishment that you had have? He said that, Life is all about these things, the things and the attributes that I, I name. So I want to tell Fred, in addition to all of that, I want to, to acknowledge some of his accomplishment. One of his current accomplishments is Fred Blankenship is the anchor of Channel 2 Action News. Um, he's working with WSB TV Channel 2 here in Atlanta, and he does an extraordinary job. He's a graduate of the University of San Francisco. He's also worked for the television station in, in Kansas City and San Diego. He's won numerous uh, awards for his stories related to drug prevention and community outreach. And so no further ado, Mr. Fred Blankenship, can you join us? Can you give me a Now, thank you very much. I appreciate you. Thank, thank you. you. Now, that's how you give an introduction, because she had all that written down, and she came up to me and basically said, Tell me about yourself before. Hello, how are you doing? Good. Oh, how, do you, how are you feeling today? Good, good. Look, my name is Fred Blankenship. I'm the morning anchor for Channel 2 Action News from 4.30 to 7. I've lived in Atlanta for 11 years, and this is my first time here at the CDC. I feel... I feel like I, I want to call, pick up the phone, and say, Mama, I made it. That's exactly how I feel today. You know, I mean, life is about enjoying the moment. And so just this weekend, my daughter, uh, one of my amazing children, my eight-year-old daughter, Layla, we're in the car, and Layla says to me, she says, I'm playing my music for her, and I think she loves it. And she turns to me and she says, why do you always play music that sounds like old people made it? And I looked at her and I said, I said, because it makes me happy. That's why I do it. And that's how I believe you should enjoy life. I believe that it makes you feel better. I believe it makes you move better. And I believe it makes you seem more appealing to other people. And if you watch Channel 2 Action News or maybe even before on social media, every morning I do these wake up videos. And it, there's nothing more than just to start your day. You know, a little bit of energy, might be some music, could be some old school 90s R&B rap. Um, I, you know, people say, how come you choose that music? I said, because, you know, the truth is, I tend to think of 90s R&B lyrics uh, for the most part. But that's, but that's just me. But the, the goal is to enjoy every possible moment. And, you know, the interesting thing is, Tomorrow, I have a milestone in my life. I turn 44 tomorrow. And, oh, thank you. 
Thank you. And you know, the cool thing about like turning 44 or turning any age is that like you become really interested in survival. <laughs> but, you know, in, in your 20s, you're somewhat interested enough to still stay out late and do it. 44, anything that y'all put out, my ears keenly to. I want to understand how to live and how to enjoy it. And a lot of the reasons why I start my day off with energy, and hopefully you start your day off with energy too, is my father a few years ago, he passed away at the age of 57. Now, to me, that's a young man. But what the interesting part about that was the last 13 to 14 years of his life were really difficult. I mean, like painful health situations. And so I've been really fascinated with how to, to make life feel better. I don't wait for the, the goal and opportunity to come so I can feel better. I make myself feel better at this very moment because I want to enjoy right now where I'm standing, looking at you, having a conversation. I think this is the best spot to be in on this planet. And hopefully you do too because we are here, we are awake, and we are ready. I want to appreciate all the great work that you guys are doing and the conversation we're going to have here today. I want to make it plain, I am by far the dumbest person in this room. <laughs> but I want to soak up all the information that we have today. And hopefully we have a great conversation. I know we will. I'm also here for selfish reasons too, beyond that. And I'm here because of the fact that my wife is a cancer survivor. And what we, and we'll get into this a bit too, but... Um, we are firm believers that what we put into our bodies, the stress that we feel, it all, it all plays a role. And so I would love to hear ideas, thoughts about what's going on in the Atlanta region, what's going on across the country, treatments available, and how we're attacking this head on. So I'm excited about being here today. Are you excited too? See, my voice changes. It goes up a little bit when I get excited. People, people are like, you know, how do you have so much energy in the morning? And I say, well, usually um, I put on the music and I just go. And so the secret to, if you watch the videos I do in the morning, uh, the wonderful makeup ladies, and right now I'm still wearing makeup right now from the morning show, the wonderful makeup uh, attendants that we have, they shoot the video. And he always asks, what, what are you gonna do in the video? And I said, it depends what's playing. You know, and that's how I think life should be. You know, go and enjoy the moment. So, are you ready to enjoy the moment today? Yeah. No, nope. no. Nope. I am the annoying morning guy. So I will make you get loud. Are you ready to enjoy the moment today? Yeah. Hey, I would argue this is the loudest this room has been at the CDC. <laughs> I would argue. I might be wrong, I might be right. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. We're gonna have a good time this afternoon, and thank you so much. Plus, you guys got me out of work today. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Uh, right now, we'd like to invite Dr. Lisa Richardson to the stage, if we could. Yes. That's right, you can give it up. Dr. Richardson is the director of the CDC's Division of Cancer Prevention and Control. She's responsible for providing leadership and direction for all scientific policy and programmatic issues related to four national programs, including the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Program. Doctor, thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, Fred, for um, that introduction. Everybody knows I have a lot of energy. Again, thanks every, to everyone for coming to Atlanta uh, for this day and yesterday to celebrate the 20th anniversary of our Comprehensive Cancer Control Program. Um, today, I've been given the honor of introducing the two winners of the Carol Friedman Comprehensive Cancer Control um, Award. This award was established in 2011 and is given each year to a true champion and leader in cancer control. 
Dr. Frieden, I mean, Dr. Friedman actually was my boss um, when she passed away, and I really enjoyed working for her. She was always genuine, um, as you can see from the photos, always had a smile on her face. You know, we don't always have a smile on our face, but, you know, she would come back the next day ready to do it again. Um, she was a dedicated physician and first joined CDC in 1991 as an EIS officer. Over the subsequent years, she worked in our cancer registries program and was the first branch chief in our comprehensive cancer control branch, um, in which I was the first science um, team lead. Carol took the registry program and our comprehensive cancer pro uh, program into the future or to where we are now. And as Fred said, you know, one of the things I've been trying to do more is uh, mindfulness, living in the moment. And stop worrying about the past, stop anticipating what the future is going to be, because you really don't know, and just enjoy yourself. Um, Carol really um, always put people first, especially the populations that we serve at CDC. Um, and so it's especially fitting that the theme for this year's award on the 20th anniversary of our program um, is excellence in reducing cancer disparities. Carol was loved and admired by many, as she touched many hearts in her public health career. In her honor, the Comprehensive Cancer Control Branch awards the highest recognition in her name. In 2018, in keeping with our program priorities and Carol's public health and medical service, we recognize two people who exemplify Carol's desire to help all people live longer and healthier lives. We're proud to announce that the 2018 recipients of the Carol Friedman Award for Excellence in Reducing Cancer Disparities are Ms. Hayam Hamad, from Michigan, and Dr. Abdul Cavino from Rhode Island. So first I'm gonna tell you about the wonderful accomplishments that they've had, and then if they're here, to come forward when I finish um, you know, talking about all the wonderful work you do, or whoever is here to um, accept the awards on their behalf. Ms. Hamad, um, is the Chronic Disease Prevention Program Supervisor for the Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services and is a member of Michigan's Cancer Consortium's Health Equity Committee. As a community leader for over 20 years, Ms. Ahmad has made it her personal and professional mission to improve cancer screening among the men and women in Michigan's Arab American community. She builds bridges between programs and community members by meeting with men and women in the places that they live, community centers, in their homes, the mosques, churches, schools, wherever they may be. Ms. Ahmad trains community health educators to work with the Arab community members as well as Asian American refugees to increase cancer screening. To ensure her work is addressing the ongoing needs, Ms. Ahmad regularly um, does surveys of the community to assess their cancer knowledge and screening behaviors in order to plan interventions. As a cancer survivor herself, she also provides substantive peer support to others diagnosed with cancer. She has established culturally appropriate support groups that allow for privacy among members. She frequently provides transportation and other instrumental needs, and she always visits cancer patients with a bouquet of flowers following their surgery, often being the first person to see them after surgery. While she's only one individual, during her work and personal time, she consistently performs the task of many, including acting as a clinician, scientist, community health worker, educator, peer supporter, and friend to all, especially to those with the greatest needs. For this, Hayam Hamad truly embodies the spirit of this award. Please join me in congratulating Ms. Hayam Hamad on her incredible service in cancer control, and let's welcome her colleagues to the podium to accept this prestigious award on her behalf. That was very nice. She acted like she was completely expecting that. <laughs> oh, all right. So for our next awardee um, is Dr. Abdul Calvino from Rhode Island. Dr. Calvino is an assistant professor at Brown University and a board-certified surgical oncologist for Roger Williams Medical Center in Providence, Rhode Island, and is a member of Rhode Island's Cancer Coalition, an 80 by 18 delegation to increase colorectal cancer screening. 
to address the fact that colorectal cancer screening rates are substantially lower among Hispanic men and women in Rhode Island compared to whites, Dr. Calvino designed and implemented a patient navigation program to overcome barriers to colonoscopy among this population. In less than two years, Dr. Calvino's program screened over 350 Hispanics with colonoscopy in Rhode Island. 42% of those screened required surgery to remove precancerous polyps, and over 50 patients were found to have colorectal cancer, which was then surgically treated. These results exemplify the profound effect of a clinical community linkage and serve as a model template for community-based interventions. Dr. Calvino's program also provides colorectal cancer screening and treatment education to Southeast Asian and Native American communities in Rhode Island. He has participated in over 20 outreach events in this educational capacity. Dr. Calvino is a dedicated surgeon whose passion for social justice and bettering his community is making a difference in reducing colorectal cancer disparities. Through his work, Dr. Calvino provided a critical need which literally saved hundreds of lives of people from the devastating effects of colorectal cancer in the last couple of years. His work serves as an inspiration for others to continue, in his words, along the right path to bridge the gap in cancer care. For this, we are honored to award Dr. Abdul Kavino the 2018 Carol Friedman Award for Reducing Cancer Disparities. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Kavino and let's welcome his colleagues to the podium to accept this prestigious award on his behalf. He's in Rhode Island saving lives. How about that? <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Dr. Richardson, thank you very much. And I would say thank you to our, our awardees there. And being in Rhode Island saving lives is the best excuse of all time for not being here. So we'll take that any day. Um, right now, as we move along, this year marks, as you've heard, the 20th anniversary of the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Program. This afternoon's program is about taking the time that we need to reflect on the program's beginnings, its expansion, and the progress of its future directions. Where can we go from here? So we're gonna dive into that right now. We are pleased to be joined by the current and former national partners, awardees, and the CDC staff who will give their perspectives on the events and opportunities that have shaped uh, the program. So right now, I'd like to invite our national partner panelists to come up to the stage, if they could, and I like to treat this stuff kind of like uh, the Falcons coming out of the tunnel, <laughs> all right? So, so when we announce their names, I want you to cheer, to, or, or whatever team you support. I realize I don't want to be Atlanta-centric here, although the Super Bowl happens to be here this year. Uh, so, we'd like to invite our national partner panelists to the stage right now, uh, Leslie Gibbon. <laughs> Oh, hey, Strategic Health Concepts. Pleasure to see you. How are you doing? Have a seat. I, I think um, I'll sit anywhere. It's fine. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, Karen Holman. <laughs> she said, go Broncos. There you go. Nina Miller. American College of Surgeons, Commission on Cancer. Go Packers! Well, Aaron Rodgers did have a great game. Cindy Benson, National Cancer Institute. Pleasure to see you. And uh, last but not least, Armin Weinberg, Intercultural Cancer Council. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. We appreciate it so much. And, um, you know, this is, as I mentioned it, I, I can't even tell you all of their degrees. And it goes for everybody in here. So I want to soap, soak all this up today and really just pick your brains as much as humanly possible today and, ha and have a conversation. And it can lead to different places. 
So I don't mind that as well. Uh, I do have some questions here, but these are jumping off points. So I appreciate your time and your candor, and uh, let's have a good time. Um, so 20 years, and, and what exactly were you doing at the time the NCCP was formed? And, and, and this does not have to be, well, at 5 o'clock 20 years ago, I was, I, I, I was doing that. But the ballpark, how things were, if we can start, and Leslie, we'll start with you. Okay. Well, I can tell you, since this is also the 20, my 20th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. <laughs> but apparently I was getting married. <laughs> um, well, so just... It's kind of a, a mix because I feel like I could sit on the CDC panel as well as the National Partners panel. But at that time, I was uh, just joining the CDC and working with um, the Division of Cancer Prevention Control to help grow the, the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Program. Before that, I was in West Virginia, and I was working for one of CDC's grantees in the breast and cervical program, and we were anticipating getting funding for comprehensive cancer control. I was working at a cancer center um, with the state health department, and so we were putting together our plan and our partnership um, in anticipation of funding, and I think West Virginia was in that second round of funding. So that's what I was doing. But, you know, was uh, anticipating a lot of support from national partners. There was a lot of interest in it. It was an interesting transition from focusing on just breast and cervical cancer to comprehensive cancer control. Thank you very much. Yeah. Karen? Well, I was 16 years old, and <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you're laughing. <laughs> um, no, I had just started a company called Strategic Health Concepts uh, with a, a person named Tom Keene, who probably many of you remember. Um, and one of our first jobs in the company was working with the Breast and Cervical Cancer Program. And um, as many of you probably remember, one of the key questions in that program was how can we ethically screen people and not have some type of follow-up and, and mechanism for uh, treatment if we do find cancer. And I think it was kind of an aha moment that there's two groups of people who weren't talking together very much, the public health folks as well as the clinical folks. And, um, and it was really fun to get those two groups of people together. My background is a nurse and an MBA, so I'm always concerned and, and interested in the two bottom lines, the health bottom line and business bottom line. And I think that that was not a conversation that had happened very much in the past. And so um, through the last 20 years, I think there's lots of bottom lines that people care about. And before, we were not talking to each other. And now um, all of those people, clinical, business folks, um, uh, physicians, and, and public health people are finally kind of talking together and getting the same bottom line um, in front of each other. Thank you. Please. You I have my own. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, 20 years ago, actually, I was working at the Cancer Information Service in their regional office in Wisconsin and, and responding to, to inquiries about uh, with people, from people and their caregivers who had questions about cancer. My organization, however, was, was invited to join in the comprehensive cancer control movement, I would almost say, at that point in time. And recognizing, um, and I know this because I interviewed the person <laughs> that hired me 10 years ago, um, who was involved 20 years ago, um, and she basically said, you know, they came to us and said, you seem to have the data and the ability to be able to, to take that data and look at it from a state perspective. And so being able to offer that as a resource, I think, to the, all of the states and the plans and the, the vision that uh, we had uh, to be able to move forward with the states creating cancer plans to, to screen and prevent uh, uh, cancer and help those who have had to deal with the diagnosis um, and treatment and, of course, survivorship along the way. So. Um, I think it was an exciting time, and, and interestingly enough, 21 years ago, I was diagnosed myself 
uh, with breast cancer. And, and so to think about that sort of 20 year journey in the same context as thinking about uh, the journey that um, I've had professionally um, has been an interesting one. And, uh, and I'm just pleased to be here. Thank you, Nina. Yeah. So 20 years ago, I just finished my master's and got a job at NCI as a presidential management intern, and I knew that much about cancer. Um, so I spent the f first few years that the national partners were being formed actually working all over the National Cancer Institute, trying to learn about what they do, how they do it, you know, from working in legislation to working in the clinical center, doing communications work. And at the same time, there was a, what I think was a visionary at NCI. Barbara Reimer had been hired to start the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. And she was extremely passionate about trying to make sure that the research that was funded by NCI was actually getting moved into practice and not just published, but practitioners could access it and understand it. And that's what she really tasked my first permanent boss, John Kerner, with, with trying to take the products that we had been developing through the extramural research program at NCI and finding a way to get that into practice. So. My first experience in comprehensive cancer control was trying to figure out what are the people that work for CDC? What are the people that work for the Cancer Information Service? What is ACS in the field? What do they need when we talk about research? Because we're a research organization, and how can we help them get into their hands the actual products of research? So, you know, from the very beginning of this, I was just learning what cancer was. I was brand new to public health, but it was a real focus, and I think that's how NCI really became engaged as a research organization with comprehensive cancer control, with trying to help figure out how do you get the science into the cancer control planning process and work with the partners and the people at the state and local level to understand what they need when we talk about evidence. So, <clears throat> you mentioned your mother. Yeah. I was trying at that time, 20 years ago, to explain to my mother what I did for a living. Uh, <laughs> she, I was doing I'm lots of there. different things. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was because I had uh, started actually at Baylor College of Medicine as a part of Dr. DeBakey's Cardiovascular Research and Demonstration Center. And then as a part of that, learned about the issues related to cancer when the Heart Association Board in our state asked me to look at a thing called special populations. And as a part of that, I came to understand an awful lot that's led me to this place today. I met a colleague, Lovell Jones, who at that time was having the first uh, biennial symposium on minorities medically underserved in cancer. And that meeting, <clears throat> led to a great deal of insight for me to bring back to the Heart Association Board. Um, and I must say, because I'm gonna do this, uh, one of the things that I did when I reported back to the Heart Association Board was I asked them each to look to their left and to their right, and if they didn't see somebody from a different racial or ethnic group or gender, then they were definitely underrepresented on this board. Um, now, having said that, what I did from there, Lovell and I, uh, collaborated as he put on these biennial symposia uh, every other year. <clears throat> we took it from Houston, where it started, to Washington, D.C., and we had uh, individuals who joined in this effort uh, from all the different racial ethnic groups, the underrepresented populations from Appalachia. Uh, we had advocates. We had researchers. We selectively invited a number of colleagues to join us. And the reason I wanted to give this background, Fred, was that you know that diversity was extremely important, and we strive today to sustain it. Um, but <clears throat> what we did at the 20 years ago was we were gaining momentum as, a, as an organization. One of our members came up with the idea that we needed to do something more than just have a symposium, 
and that was Pam Jackson. And Pam said, what we're talking about, what we really need is an intercultural cancer council. And that's what gave birth to the ICC. Um, as a part of that, one of the members, Bobby D. Cordova Hank, said, what we really need to do is put our agendas aside and speak with one voice. So we came up with our motto of speaking with one voice. So up to that 20 years ago, at that time, we were really gaining momentum. We had learned how to speak with one voice. We were holding these biennial symposia, which brought together 1,000 to 1,500 individuals to DC with the help of funders like CDC, NCI, Cancer Society, Coleman and others, Baylor College of Medicine, MD Anderson, uh, to basically address this. Okay, so with that, uh, 20 years ago, we put out something that was a special supplement in the Cancer Journal about the research and activities related to it. And then we worked with the Centers for Disease Control that gave us a, a collaborating uh, cooperative agreement to help organize a national network of diverse individuals like we had brought together for the council. And that really, I think, gave us a lot of traction to start joining in this collaborative effort with the national partners. And one last thing I'd say at that time, 20 years ago, we'll come back to it, I hope, later, is that we were able with the ICC, with support and sign-on of members like this, to get the Institute of Medicine study commissioned Senator Specter was very instrumental in helping us get that done. That led to the Unequal Burden of Cancer IOM report about that same time. So it was a very uh, key point for us to join this, this collaborative effort. Can I, can I ask you, can I jump in here? As you mentioned, uh, that was 20 years ago, and uh, you mentioned diversity is a big thing. I, I see to your left, you said look to your right and your left, I see this wonderful group of women right here, uh, beautiful, strong women right here. To your right, this debonair, handsome African-American man. Um, do, we, do we have diversity? Do we, are you reaching the level that you were hoping to reach? I think, I think in terms of the program activities of this effort, I think we've done a tremendous job in doing so. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't say that we've been as successful in all areas. Uh, certainly in, we see that there is still a need because what happens is, you know, uh, we tend to, how should I say this, we tend to want and should get the best possible people engaged in these efforts. At the same time, I think it's just really important to continue to ask the question, do we have the kind of representation of people from those communities? Often people ask me why I was involved, and I thought, well, it's because I, I had a great experience. My father was a great teacher, took me on his volunteer days to help set up a, a vision screening program for the Cleveland public school system. So while I was not a person of color, I had been immersed in and understood a lot of the issues. It wasn't from there, so I knew I never could quite do it and always strive to make sure that we got the representation. Uh, because I think we have come a long way, but we have to keep always asking for that same, do we have the diversity right. that we really need? Right. Thank you very much. And we, we touched on this slightly a little while ago in each of your answers here, but what was the conversation like 20 years ago when it came to in terms of, of, of cancer prevention, cancer diagnosis, getting people on the same page with that? Nina, if I can start with you. We talked about where you were 20 years ago, but like, what was, what were the conversations taking place at that time? You know, I, I, one of the conversations that was taking place was how is cancer impacting those who are economically disadvantaged? And I think that was a real focus 20 years ago, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, Dr. Harold Freeman from Harlem Hospital was looking at um, cancer in the poor and how that was um, impacting a community um, that experiences poverty. Um, to speaking to Armin's um, point, I think we're still talking about cancer disparities um, and those who experience it, and I think that the impoverished is, is one of those groups that experience access issues and things like that. So. So uh, we were talking about that 20 years ago for sure um, and working to find ways to um, enhance that. And I think still today, many of the people in this audience are, 
are working uh, on those issues, whether it be um, patient navigators to help patients to um, access their uh, care, um, their screening, their care, um, or resources that they need to be able to complete their treatment. So uh, that's one thing that I would say. And I think, you know, at the National Cancer Institute, Otis Brawley, who's now the chief medical officer for the American Cancer Society, he was the director of our Office of Science Poli of Special Populations at NCI. So NCI had a focus on this, and then Harold Freeman came in, and we actually opened the Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities. And they've always been a partner. Um, one of the things I remember 20 years ago, approximately, was trying to figure out how to help partners across the country use data to identify where those populations were and what those disparities were. So NCI and CDC collaborated on state cancer profiles to help really be able to use data to tell the story so that if you were at a state coalition or you were trying to make the case to a um, legislator as to why you needed to focus in a specific population, that you could take data that could easily justify why this and not that, and use a visual representation of data, because that was something that we had been hearing that it was hard to get the information to be able to tell those stories. So. Karen? Same question? Yeah, same question. <laughs> Okay, conversations we were having 20 years ago. Um, oh, I can't even remember yesterday. <laughs> no, I think a um, couple things. I think uh, 20 years ago, again, thinking about the breast and cervical cancer program, which is really kind of the foundation of how all of this started, we were very focused on trying to figure out the barriers. Remember how everybody was like doing barriers to screening, barriers to care, and, and that was great. We needed to know that information. So a lot of the conversations was around barriers, and I think we've evolved over the last 20 years to knowing what those barriers are and having some great evidence-based interventions to address those barriers. But I think what's happening differently that was not necessarily happening 20 years ago is the type of people we're talking to. Um, I mean, as you guys all know, I think comprehensive cancer control is so much about relationships, right? It's, it's who's around the table, who you're talking to, the populations that you want to reach, and making sure that those populations are at the table and you're talking with them. And I think that 20 years ago, we weren't even really sure who should have been around the table, and that we were looking at very kind of fundamental things like how do we use data, how do we get the data, how do we find out what the barriers are. And now I think we're doing a pretty good job of we have all of those ingredients, and now when we sit down with people around the table, that's what's happening. I think that didn't happen 20 years ago, is, is getting people to talk about these things and applying the knowledge that we do have in the best way that we can. So I don't know if many of you know this, but we've alluded to it a couple times, but really comprehensive cancer control grew out of the breast and cervical cancer screening program. Some of you remember that. <laughs> and there were actually breast... Uh, cancer coalitions. There were some breast and cervical cancer coalitions that existed in the states. So I would say what I was hearing in the field was somewhat of a little bit of skepticism. What is comprehensive cancer control and who are these comprehensive people who want to come in and take over our stuff? <laughs> so there was a little bit of that in the field, but also at the same time an excitement because it gave you an opportunity work to work with a di different set of partners than maybe you had been working with before. And you know, all along, you'd get pushback at a state health department or within a partnership um, organization. What are you doing for men? You know, you're always talking about breast and cervical cancer. When are you going to do something for us? <laughs> and so, or when are we going to move beyond just those two cancer sites? And there are lots of survivors who need help, no matter the type of cancer. And then at, at CDC, and CDC was, is one of the national partners, it was then too. You know, we were in a position of trying to figure out cobbling together funding for comprehensive cancer control. There was no line item. Trying to justify what we were doing, trying to define what we meant by comprehensive cancer control, and then finding it a little bit difficult. 
but still knowing it was the right thing to do and kept pushing forward and knowing that we could get really great partners to come and join us. So those were the conversations that I remember at that time. Yeah, from our, from our point, it was the, we picked up on this idea of the unequal burden of cancer. So as you were pointing out data, we discovered through that study that was done that there really were gaps or really were issues. Everything from representation and review groups to funding disparities to the HBCUs and others, you know, where there were real problems. But the good news is we also discovered that there were opportunities for making impact. So the healthy people objectives that were being developed, we knew that they could never be accomplished and probably still can't be accomplished if we don't address the disparities that we've talked about. But about that same time, Fred, what was happening was there was a national dialogue on cancer that took hold that was looking for ways to really bring leaders from this community as well as the public and private sector together to try and do something special. And that provided a safe harbor for people like Governor Tom Rich, who as a member of that national dialogue was also president of, I think, the National Governors Association, who went back to that organization and said, we need every state to have a comprehensive cancer plan. You know, little things like that were taking place. So the discussion at that time, I think, was, you know, how do we really seize this opportunity and go forward, yet recognize we had some serious holes. This uh, next question I will read word for word, because I want to make sure I get it right. Um, how is your support slash technical assistance for comprehensive cancer control evolved over the years? So what, what kind of support have we been getting for this, and how has it grown? I think that we've really changed the way that we give technical, technical support from the national partner's perspective. Um, I think each of our organizations does technical assistance to various organizations. Um, when I first started, when there were only a handful of plans, there was a bit of skepticism, I think, as to why NCI was at the table as a research organization so as a national partner, the one thing that we did is we provide, how many, I don't even know if anybody remembers this, we paid for concept mapping for every state to pull the people within their state around what needed to be in their plans so that they, because they were still at the development phase, um, and every state we developed a concept map for them and helped them through sticky notes and facilitation, kind of come up with a rough draft of their cancer plan so that they could go back to their state and, and really start writing their plan. And, and I still have my national concept map t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and it became, I, you know, and I think that... Do you? Does anybody else? Yeah, so... You know, that was, that was something I think that was really important because if you don't have a plan, you have to have a mechanism for getting a plan. And that was one way that NCI was able to help provide technical assistance that was way outside of our normal comfort zone as a research organization. Although concept mapping is a research method that I did my dissertation on. <laughs> Okay, well, <laughs> um, as you know, Leslie and I are all about technical assistance, so, um, so I think how it has evolved over the years is, is in a couple ways. Um, I think, you know, the national partnership ev consists or, or exists, I guess, to support the coalitions. Hopefully you all know that that is the mission of the national partnership. It is not, CDC supports the programs obviously, but the partnership is to support the coalitions. And, and even though over 20 years we have been providing support to the coalitions, I think we have um, evolved over the last couple, or several years I should say, um, to, to get more feedback from the actual coalitions that we're trying to serve. So sometimes you probably think it's too much um, feedback. We, we're trying to consolidate surveys and how many questions we ask, but we really try to understand, kind of put, keep our pulse on what's happening in the coalitions and making sure that needs are being met, gaps are being filled, um, opportunities are being seized. And I think um, the responsiveness of the national partnership has improved over those 20 years. 
I would say we, sometimes we've also learned that we just need to get out of the way and let you all learn from each other in particular, right? So that's, that's one of the things I think the National Partnership has learned very well and, and has done. And sometimes then we also push issues out. So, you know, Caleb talked today about colorectal cancer and 80 by 18, um, and we pushed that out to the coalitions. I mean, some of you were already picking it up, but we did that. We pushed out HPV vaccination uptake. Early days, we pushed out addressing disparities, thanks to Armin and ICC and, and other things like that. So while I think we've followed you along and you've led us, we've also pushed out a few issues that we felt like were important for coalitions to take up. Yeah, I would like to actually add to that because one of the other issues that we've been pushing out of late um, has been healthy behaviors for survivors. And I'm very passionate about that. And I think that that's a trend that's actually fairly recent and new with paying attention to the needs of the millions of survivors that are living here in the United States. And just making this whole concept of having had cancer be one of rehabilitation and living the best life you can live and being as healthy as possible. And so many of the concepts that you guys are such expert in with nutrition and physical activity and screening um, are so vitally important to that survivor uh, population. And so by applying those sort of wellness activities, not to the entire population, but focusing in on that cancer survivor population, I think is just a re really critical movement that we've fairly recently embarked on and uh, a really important one. How, if I can jump in real fast, how are we doing focusing on that cancer survivor population? Yeah, others may want to weigh in, but just sort of briefly, and anyone in this room could probably tell you that, by, by initiatives in each state and, and loca locales as well for pushing nutrition, pushing physical activity, making sure that access to you know, adequate screening is available um, to all the, the population and, and et cetera, et cetera, sort of a real... Uh, important public health model and a rehabilitation kind of model. You know, I think cancer, a cancer diagnosis is a difficult one to hear, um, and oftentimes the diagnosis and treatment are a difficult journey. Um, but if we can instill a mindset, I think, of health and wellness following a diagnosis, whether it is to have the best quality of life for the end of life or not like to live a really healthy, productive, long life following a diagnosis. And that's a part of the change, I think, not necessarily from 20 years ago, but maybe decades previous to that. Um, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't quite so um, hopeful, right. I guess, of, of, uh, of an outlook. But today we've got a really hopeful outlook for many survivors of many cancers. Well, and I think just like the coalition's at the state and local level, we have a new work group focused on this that we're really trying to figure out how as national partners can we collaborate around healthy behaviors for survivors to do more than just each of our individual organizations. So we're putting that together right now as well. And kind of going back to the technical assistance as it's evolved over time, you know, I think our bread and butter when we started were the leadership institutes. Um, which I think were really, really powerful because it brought large groups of states, tribes, territories, and the Pacific Island jurisdictions together so that they could get some knowledge but also learn from each other. And that's what Leslie means, you know, like kind of getting out of your way and letting you learn from each other. And that was some of the best trainings that I experienced. I really enjoyed that. But it was also, 20 years ago, a different fiscal situation. I mean, 20 years ago, NCI's budget was being doubled. We're not there anymore. So I think over time, with money, but also the technology that's out there and the way that we can deliver technical assistance has had to evolve. And I think that we've, we've been doing that with the colorectal and the HPV technical assistance, the TA that we're going to be providing for healthy behaviors. But we've had to also kind of reassess and go back to our bread and butter, which for the national partners is focusing around sustaining coalitions. Because I think that that's something that as national partners, 
we do pretty well. And we need to make sure that we're focusing on that. Oh, just quickly, I think uh, very apropos for today, one of the things that we also dealt with uh, it was disaster preparedness. Um, one of the things that we were asked to deal with after Katrina in particular uh, was to learn from that. And I was very happy to see that the ICC in that way with the coalitions were able to reach into the areas of the Gulf Coast, but then come up with things that could be shared with others. And I'm reminded because of today, uh, the grab and go bags that our colleague from Biloxi, Mississippi, actually she was Ocean Spring, but close, uh, came up with and shared with us about how they were helping their cancer patients when they got discharged to know, to make sure they had the right medications, you know, to take with them and wouldn't get caught short. Uh, those are the kind of lessons that I think we've been able to share through the coalitions. The question I have, and I always like to put this out to, to groups, and because I think it's important, uh, I spend my whole day telling stories. And when you, when you look at the, the media, the national media, in terms of what's out there about cancer information, what do you like and what do you not like? There's always one to grab the microphone first for that one. So, I think you're probably going to know what I'm going to say. I think the thing that's challenging coming from the evidence is how the media has to pick up. And it's important to know all of the research that's coming out. But the communication of this causes cancer, this doesn't cause cancer, chocolate's good for you, red wine's good for you, chocolate's bad for you, red wine is bad for you. It doesn't help with promoting what we know does work from the guidelines. Because um, guidelines aren't sexy. And I think one of the things that John Kerner, my old boss, used to say is the challenge with news is it needs to be new. Um, and when we have all of the research that we fund, and we fund many, many studies that help build the evidence, because one study does not the evidence make, it's all of the studies that are able to be used in a systematic review that lead to our community guidelines, that lead to the US Preventive Services Task Force, though, and leads to the guidelines that come from other organizations those are a little bit harder to get people really jazzed about when there's so much news that comes out. But I think our job as public health practitioners is to really think about the evidence and to be trained into how to understand it and communicate it and make sure that the best evidence is being put into practice. And that's one of the things that the National Partners has really tried to do over the years. And that's why NCI is in the game is because we want the evidence that's out there to be actually put into practice. But people love to hear that they can eat chocolate those. Uh -huh. <laughs> and drink water. <laughs> Go ahead. You know, I, I, you know, I think what I would like to see is, I, I give you a kind of a story. I think the work that's being done by these coalitions and their partners, the people that make them up, it's a story that when I talk to people in business or in, in legislative settings, really don't, they say, I didn't know that. Uh, why don't we hear more about that? Well, it may not be the sort of attention-grabbing news. It's really the thing that I think is newsworthy. And I, I really think we did something with the ICC many years ago that some people might recall. We worked with the uh, newspaper chain, Knight, Knight Ritter, and they did a complete series on the disparities, which was probably, I've forgotten about it until we just started talking, but it was really instrumental in getting a lot of traction with a lot of people because it told the story that needed to be told. And I think that's something that uh, it, the media hasn't done enough of. Uh, maybe you can start something where you could, you know, get your colleagues, you know, around the country to really identify some of these programs that are really having an impact, that are unique in their communities, addressing the issues of those communities with the support of a, a national partnership. 
And, and just to add to this conversation, I think the, the thing that's hard about this is that we're talking about individuals and how they hear this information and process it for individual behavior change, right? And that's a tough nut to crack, and we always need to kind of keep our eye on that ball. But as you all know, we have changed so much from going to an approach that's all about individual behavior change to, right, PSE, everybody, you know, policy systems, environmental change. And I think that we have had so much success when we, I always love it, it, it you know, a policy system and environmental change is either you put up a barrier to stop somebody from doing something or you take down a barrier to help somebody make a better choice. And um, that, I think, um, everybody here um, and CDC for spearheading that change from individual behavior change to population-based change has been such a wonderful, significant thing. Um, so kudos to all of you for that. I would I mean, it's a good question. I think part of um, one thing that public health folks deal with is the mashup between social media and news. Well, because, you know, and I'm glad you said that because really the information is everywhere. Whether you're on a podcast, whether you're on your Facebook feed or something, you're going to get some information. And because it comes to you and because we, we have children and jobs and responsibilities, I will take that. And that's how, you, that's how people get their information, when they really should get it from the credible right, source. Exactly. So I think folks like you and health reporters can do a really great job of bringing you know, the, the evidence behind the facts in a way that's engaging. And, I, and I, you know, one example is with HPV vaccination. So there are lots of people who are out there who are anti-vaccination, and they have loud voices that comes up through social media most right. often. So I think it's both a good thing and it can be challenging. Yeah, and I'm sure on your end it's hard sometimes to get public health people to stop speaking public health and speak in a way that's that's that meets people. So I'm sure that well, it's supposed well, to yeah. And, 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 and I'm glad you understand that because because people, you know, the truth is people at home they they are they are not paying that close of attention. They're looking for that little nugget they can take away with them. And so, and just so you know, whenever I read the, the chocolate is proven to have better benefits for your health or whatever, I'm reading the story and saying, this may not be true <laughs> in my head. Because we, the information is new, but we, you know, if you've seen the credible sources, sometimes you know there's more to the story than that. Do you want to chime in on how the media is kind of messing up on this? <laughs> Okay, all right. <laughs> where, where do we go from here? What's next? What could and what should happen, especially on, on the national stage? You want me to go first? Okay, so I'm going to um, suggest that I think we have to obviously sustain and take advantage of the wonderful infrastructure you may have gathered. That's one of the things that, that I've been really keen on because if I were looking at this um, as a, something that people, if they were in business or if you were trying to really accomplish something, there's this huge network. I'm not sure there's many like this. I've said this before. That is throughout our country that could be taken advantage of to implement, distribute. You know, I think about oil and gas because I'm from Texas. You know, it's one thing to develop, you know, the ability to pull it out of the ground. It's another to have it at the gas station when you pull in with your car. This, to me, is sort of an analogy. We've got the ability with the partners and the information to really deliver information much more effectively. But one of the problems that I've seen, this is what I'm going to recommend, is that uh, when we were doing this national dialogue on cancer, we had the leaders of the Centers for Disease Control and the NCI and others, and we had these people who were governors. But the people from NCI and CDC, we had to get the president of the United States to make an exception that they could sit in those meetings and bring their kind of thoughts in an open, safe environment. One of the things that I think has really limited this effort a little bit, from my own experience, is the inability to really get the people into advocacy because they worry about lobbying. And also, there's a hesitancy often to get business involved at the local level. And I think uh, if you look at this opportunity that this network really provides, maybe we can get an exemption from Congress for this program so that we could actually get people advocating more and uh, people from the business community engage more. And that includes the health business, by the way. 
Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? I think as a federal employee, I, I'm not going to say that I think it's a good idea that I'm able to advocate, but I think there are things that we participate in that help inform how people can then take action as an advocate. Um, we're always really careful because we get money from Congress. So I understand that concern. Um, for the national partners, I think one of the things that we need to continue doing and probably do better is to enhance what were the services that we're providing to the coalitions so that we aren't duplicating efforts. It's still really hard because every one of us, like everyone here that works in a coalition, has a full-time job. And it's hard to know everything that goes on at NCI, to, regardless of how many people we have engaged in the partnership. So when we're trying to figure out what we're going to do in partnership with Commission on Cancer, ICC, ACS, CDC, sometimes we don't get it right. I think we actually have to broaden the engagement within our organization so that we have a better idea of what's going on. I think we've started to do that. I think a great example is you know, the work that we're doing in HPV We've gone beyond Division of Cancer Prevention and Control, and we've got the immunization program, which was a brand new partnership for us. We've never worked with immunization. But if we're talking vaccination, they've got to be at the table. And we've preached this to coalitions, but we have to really practice what we preach around expanding who we're engaging within our organizations so that we can benefit the work that we're doing to support the coalitions. Because we've been here 20 years. There's gonna, we need to get some younger blood in and, and other people, so. Yeah, I totally agree. I think embrace the innovation, embrace the minds of the millennials that are in our lives now. Oh, and, nice. <laughs> embrace the social media. Um, you know, we're in a changing world clinically with personalized medicine and genomics and all of those kinds of things. I think the future is is bright. It's fast moving. It's exciting. Um, but I, you know, I think that we're uh, we're all in it together, and uh, exciting things will be happening. Okay, so this is like the inspirational part, the speech. You know? <laughs> um, well, I just think two things. One is um, we need to just continue to do, and I think we are doing a great, you guys, when I say are, we're all one together, um, doing a great job of measuring progress and communicating progress. And I think the more that that is done and the better we do at communicating the impact that comprehensive cancer control is having, um, the, more, the more clout we'll have, the more strength will have, the, the louder our messages will be. Um, the second thing, it kind of goes along with that, is that I think um, for a long time we've, we talk about coalitions being the engine of change across the nation. And that is so true, and I think lots of times we get so caught up in, in the the hard part of coalitions, and it is hard, that relationship building and that keeping it going, but, but coalitions are the engine of change for cancer control across the nation. And I think once we start even recognizing that more internally and communicating that more, we can make even bigger and better changes as we move forward. Uh, I think that's right, Karen. The engines of change, you, you guys are the programs and the people who lead those. And I would agree with Cindy and Nina that we need to look at new leadership. One of us is retired in the next, I don't know how many years. The other of us might also be. <laughs> so, um, you know, thinking about other leaders to step forward, I think, is something that we need to think about, not just for us as national partners, but also for you within your, your coalitions and even your programs. Um, and so trying to give opportunities and let people have experiences and come up through those coalitions is important. Um, I, you know, you all know, I'm sure you probably heard at this meeting and have heard from Lisa and others about um, the academies with the funding, with support from CDC, NCI, and ACS are looking at a national strategy 
for cancer control in the U.S., so a national cancer plan. The United States has never had a, a national cancer plan because we've always had 50 state plans and seven plus tribal plans and Pacific Island jurisdictions and territories. But that's coming up. We don't know exactly where it's going to go, but I think you all need to be ready to be a part of that. Um, and the National Partnership has been saying to the Academy staff and to the members of the committee that are working on that study that the coalitions, you all are the, should be the center of any kind of a national strategy for cancer control in the U.S. if we're going to have a written plan. So that's one thing I, I would want to see, and I think it could be a really great thing. It could, you know, blast the, the um, war on cancer, which has kind of been switched to the moon shot. You know, we can really think about um, doing something different. Um, so I think that's there. The other thing I would say is that I think we need to watch for kind of pendulum swift uh, changes back swings, changes back. So we still have to persist with um, looking at coalitions and making sure that they're well-functioning. At the end of the day, if you're not well-functioning, if the relationships aren't good, then you know what can you do as a coalition? So I think that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. The other is, I think you know we've said, oh, tobacco, Corinne and I were talking about this. Tobacco is taking care of itself, or the breast and cervical program is fine. But, you know, some things are slipping backwards in those areas. And I think you all, as programs and as comprehensive cancer control coalitions, can ha take a really critical role in making sure that we don't slide any further back in those areas. So that's what I see is that we don't want to, we want to look to the future. We, want, we don't want to forget about the past. And, and be, as Lisa said, we want to try to be present. But we got to make sure we watch for those things that are coming up in the future. Well, thank you very much. I'm amazed and intrigued, um, especially in my business, that there is not a national cancer plan. You and the rest of the world. That is, that, that is something I'm going to be thinking about for a while. Interesting. Um, well, please give a round of applause for our National Partners panel, please. And I, I, I like them to go out the way they came in. Round of applause. Leslie Gibbons, please. <laughs> Garrett Holman. Nina Miller, Cindy Vincent, and Armin Weinberg. Thank you very much. We're going to have a little five-minute transition for our next panel, and thank you very much for your engagement and your great words. This is fantastic. We have our awardee panel coming up next. And I'm going to call your name up, and please... Look at this group right here. <laughs> Remember, coming out of the tunnel, still the same thing. We have Rachel Coughlin from Texas. Come on up, Rachel. Pleasure to see you. How you doing? That's right. Ava Crawford, North Carolina. Pleasure, pleasure to have you here. Pleasure. Right, we have Carrie Lopez, <laughs> Northwest Portland area, Indian Health Board. Go Niners, go Ducks. <laughs> go Niners, go Ducks. That's right. Pac-12 representing, here we go. <laughs> Angela McFall, Michigan. It is a pleasure. All right, Gail Merriam, Massachusetts. Tom Brady in disguise. There you go. Crystal Morewood, Colorado. <laughs> Pleasure. I'm sorry? Von Miller. Von Miller. Yes, yes. I mean, with the football information, everybody's very strong today. That's fantastic. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. I'm going to move on down a little bit and uh, just get comfortable here. But we appreciate you being here today and uh, taking a look. Can you guys still hear me? Okay, great. Great. Um, we're going to start here with um, the question, what was the extent of your uh, cancer control efforts prior to this organization, NCCP? I'm assuming you're pointing to me. Right, right at, at you, at me. Rachel. Right at you. So I'll go first. Um, so I obviously have not been around the 20 years and do not have the amazing wisdom that our previous panel has. 
Um, but it, it was an honor to look at the history of Texas and be able to dive into that history. And um, it was fascinating to learn that in 1984, Texas House of Representatives actually appointed a legislative tax force for cancer. So they had this mindset of comprehensive cancer control kind of before it became a movement. And they created this task force to look at long-term and short-term goals for cancer prevention control. And what actually came out of that was a Texas Cancer Council. Um, so legislative appointed a Texas, Texas Cancer Council um, and then they ended up developing the first Texas cancer plan in 1985, which was amazing to read about. And with that, they created a task force and established 300 volunteers to write that first plan. And then by 1998, when the first comprehensive cancer control FOA was released, um, Texas was on their third edition of their Texas cancer plan. So that was wonderful to read. And that Texas cancer council um, was later developed into the Cancer Prevention Institute and Research in Texas, and um, they have been very successful. Um, they are no longer existing today now that we receive this funding. So that's kind of where we were back in the day. Nice. Ah, hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> um, well, I hail from North Carolina, so if you hear that little set, that southern accent, that's where it's coming from. <laughs> um, actually, from North Carolina, we actually dated all the way back to 1945. Uh, originally, when, um, with North Carolina, we had a group that at the time was called uh, the Women's Field Army, but also now, now is the American Cancer Society. They got together with our uh, North Carolina Medical Society. Society and went to our General Assembly. And they went to them and urged them to uh, be able to establish some type of program or some type of collaborative to work on comprehensive cancer control. And so after that, uh, we were able to at least get it established at that point and receive some, a small pot of funding uh, to go toward those efforts, uh, but also had funding and support from the um, society itself to actually uh, support the uh, program. Now, in 1947, moving forward just a little bit, the General Assembly then, that's when they put uh, their small pot of money to go toward to help supplement some of the efforts. Now, moving forward to uh, 92, that at that point, that's when the wheels really started moving, um, get, getting some momentum. Um, there was a report that was put out, which was a Cervical Cancer Task Force report. Uh, that was actually presented to the North Carolina General Assembly. And uh, that report itself uh, proposed that they establish a statewide cancer uh, coordinating and control body for the state. And uh, at that point, that's when they wanted to establish our cancer coalition known as the Advisory Committee on Cancer Coordination and Control. So in 93, moving a little faster, getting up forward there, uh, that's when North Carolina became one of the original six uh, of the CDC-funded Conference of Cancer Control programs. Um, and uh, we are actually currently housed in the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services in the Division of Public Health uh, in what we call the Chronic Disease and Injury Section. Because of this, the General Assembly mandated having, um, they enacted a statute and mandated that the actual advisory committee be formed. Uh, and once they mandated that, they also established 34, uh, a membership of 34 members to be appointed uh, by the governor, the Senate, and the House of Representatives. Uh, we've had some folks that say, oh, they've got their hands in that, but that actually works out very well for us because that commitment is there from, from the General Assembly to um, uh, continue that, um, that engagement with uh, North Carolina itself and cancer coordination control. Now, the advisory committee serves as a statewide advisory board in cancer-related legislation, in policy, regulations, and even standards. Um, it included the recommendation uh, to also develop our first cancer plan for the, for the state of North Carolina. Um, the advisory committee also uh, serves uh, as a board for our central cancer registry as well. 
1995, uh, at that point, also for North Carolina, we were able to get what's, our, what's called, everybody knows, as the Wise Woman Project as part of the cancer branch itself. So we actually fall under the cancer branch um, in North Carolina. Hello? Okay, wake up, everyone. <laughs> Um, it was really fun listening to the previous panel. I'm from the Northwest Portland Area and Health Board. Um, I'm Carrie Lopez. I'm a member of the Talawa tribe. And I work with the 43 tribes in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. So it's really, I've, I've been in this business for 25 years. Um, so we had a, a tobacco coalition, a, tab a tribal tobacco policy project. We, through the state, had a women's health coalition. And I really credit that to a progressive um, strong woman leader we had at the time. So when the previous panel was talking about kind of the journey, um, this, the Tribal Tobacco Policy Project was the special populations grant through NCI. Linda B. was my project officer. Um, the Portland Area Health Board was a recipient for the National Minority Organizations. We were one of the original seven minority organizations. But I wanted to share just a little story about that because when that was happening and we were applying for that grant and they were looking for those minority organizations because we're talking health equity and we're talking the history, I'm going to share that that's when blogs were first becoming kind of a deal. The population who had previously worked in cancer prevention and tobacco prevention were not warm and welcoming and fuzzy about the national minority organizations. There were some very um, interesting posts of why are these people who've never done work in cancer prevention, uh, why are these people, and I'm saying these people, um, who don't have resources getting this funding. So it, it's been a long journey. And when I look back that we were one of the original comp cancer programs, that we were a tribal organization really, again, was my progressive leader. I really believe that. And Donnie Wilder was her name, and she pushed us in the direction of getting all the funding. Um, so we were doing a lot of stuff already, and I'm really proud to say that, and we've continued to do it. And I'll save the rest for another question. <laughs> but um, I've, I've lived the journey, and it's really been good, and I've seen some very positive changes, but I've also lived some kind of ugly things also. So my name is Angela McFall, and I am from Michigan with the Comp Cancer Program. I've only been serving in that role for about a year. I've been in cancer for about eight years, so I was able to go back, and fortunately we have history um, in our institutional knowledge in our department, so I was able to go back and learn um, all about what they had done, and, it, and I was amazed at what, it was an honor to learn it. So in 1987, we had our first state cancer advisory board, um, and that was an appointed bunch of a group of individuals. Um, they developed breast and cervical cancer screening guidelines. They also uh, distributed a uh, breast cancer treatment booklet, option booklet, which was mandated by state law. They were, we were one of the first states to implement mammography quality for digital mammograms. And they also um, held a prostate cancer uh, con consensus conference. Uh, at that time, we were also fortunate enough to receive state funding. And so that money we um, awarded to three large universities in our state. And those uh, universities worked on cervical cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, and we funded uh, nicotine replacement therapy for tobacco cessation programs. So I was thinking uh, back to actually 1992, <clears throat> where I was um, just finished, I was finishing up my master's in public health. <clears throat> and at that point, um, I was working for the American Cancer Society, uh, and I was overseeing their um, pain, cancer pain initiative uh, statewide. What was happening at that point, I remember how exciting it was because um, uh, American Cancer Society, my boss, <laughs> I remember was spending a lot of her time, uh, along with every, uh, a lot of other people, um, with ballot um, holding up <clears throat> different signs, promoting um, a 25 cent increase on the price of cigarettes. 
um, and that was a ballot question, and it passed. And but I remember the the amount of being on the the ACS side to see how much of their you know free time was devoted towards pushing that 25 cent um, increase. So um, there was a lot of strong policy and uh, systems change at the beginning of Massachusetts. Um, and what that 25 um, cent, um, there was just one sort of um, uh, event in this um, uh, journey of uh, cancer control. It produced millions of dollars for tobacco education. Um, and. Um, really accelerated the decline of smoking in the state of Massachusetts and um, really produced a, a really strong sense of the ability to have an impact, um, not only in, in against the tobacco industry, but also um, for public health. So that's really sort of um, a, a beginning part of cancer um, control, and I think American Cancer Society played a, a very ma major role in that. And so I think that generated a lot of excitement and empowerment for the coalition that formed um, subsequently when um, the cancer uh, program started <clears throat> based at Department of Public Health, which I'm now at, um, is that there was really an, a, a sense that we were, people really had the ability to go against a very powerful lobbying group and to really implement uh, a significant policy and systems change. So we sort of started there um, with a really strong focus on tobacco and um, the focus on primary prevention um, for cancer. That's how it sort of started prior to 1998. Thank you. My name is Crystal Morwood. I'm the Cancer Unit Manager at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And I'm going to go ahead and give myself a C, maybe a C minus on this question on the preparation. <laughs> I'm going to keep it free. So before 1998, uh, we were mainly focused in tobacco control and breast and cervical cancer screening. Um, in 1993, when I was in a different state as a sophomore in high school, uh, that's <laughs> when the Cancer Coalition in Colorado formed. So they did have a, a little bit of a sense that something big was coming from the nation. Uh, Dr. Tim Byers was part of that team. Sarah Miller um, was part of that team, um, So, and as well as American Cancer Society. We developed our first cancer plan in 1996, and then were funded um, by the, the COM Cancer Program in 1998. Wait till we get you, to the end. Okay, I'm going to give you an A for your answer. <laughs> if, if, if you can go back to high school time and come up with an answer for currently, uh, you, you are impressive to me. Uh, you know, one thing that came up was, was the, and it came up during the last panel too, and it was the question about the idea of tobacco taking care of itself. And that really is not the case. And, and at least maybe it, it is not the case. I, I know when I walk around and I see people, you know, it, it's been a long time since I grew up in the Virginia Slims and you've come a long way, baby. You know, but, so you think it's gone, but it's not. If, if we can address the tobacco situation in, in cancer right now, please. Yeah. No, I think, I think it's really true. And I think, um, you know, we know that um, and one of our things we're looking at is um, someone said it before, uh, previous day, about cancer survivors smoking. I mean, we, you know, in Massachusetts, um, we don't even know, we don't know them, how many cancer survivors are being referred to tobacco cessation. So we're going to have to start at the beginning and do a survey. And I know um, even um, Dana-Farber um, Cancer Institute, which is the um, big um, tertiary care, they're having trouble finding a t smoking cessation counselor. Um, so it's a tough issue. Yeah. Uh, for North Carolina, um, we, we really work hard to stay true to that, that vision or the values of comprehensive cancer control, and, and meaning everything we do is through partnerships. So all of our different efforts, one, our Cancer Coalition, we have the Tobacco Prevention and Control Branch as part of our partnerships or partners that's involved uh, with that. But then also as the state program itself, we have different initiatives that we work on together. Um, one in particular is our Cancer Survivorship Summit that we've, we've been doing for 12, this will be our 12th year coming up for uh, cancer survivors and their caregivers. And we make sure we have the tobacco representation uh, during the planning, but having that, that uh, tobacco cessation component 
um, meaning having some sessions as well as having uh, representatives there that can provide services or support resources for those cancer survivors that still may be using tobacco products and be able to connect them to those services on the spot so that way hopefully we can connect them to things to help them either reduce or to um, you know, move more to cessation. And then we do other um, education components, uh, such as with um, the big HUD uh, initiative that um, was kicked off this year for HUD housings to um, focus on going smoke free. And uh, we work with the tobacco branch there to first develop a, sort of a promotion series where we put posters, we created posters together, um, informing the HUD housing um, communities that, okay, by this time, you're going to be smoke, you know, it's going to have to go smoke free and it's going to be law. Um, and then we also, um, provided some additional educational things that they could be able to provide to the residents of those HUD housing, as well as some follow-up posters that they can put up that had a QR code that they could um, scan to be able to get connected to smoke cessation services. But we worked with the tobacco branch uh, regional managers who work directly with those HUD housing areas. So it's that overlap of, of having that multi-prong approach or that multi-layer approach to be able to reach folks. But it's that partnership piece that's the real link. Did you really ask about tobacco? <laughs> wow. Um, I started out in tobacco policy, and I'm really uh, a huge tobacco cessation policy prevention advocate. Um, some of my tribal partners that are sitting in the room know this. So when we hear that stat of the national average of 15%, um, of the population still smokes in our communities, try 35, try 40, and try 45. You want to, I mean, we're talking about going, go to the res or Hawaii. I was just in Hawaii and amazed by the tobacco smoking. Um, so we, we have a ways to go, but we do know things that work. We've had successful programs in our clinics. Um, the multi-pronged approach, for sure, having an uh, integrated approach where, like, my, a number of my tribes have the pharmacy involved, the health educators involved, the nurse involved, the diabetes program involved, the maternal child health nurse involved. Um, and again, when you look at our youth smoking rates, it's, it's terrifying. So we do know there's things that work. It takes money. It takes resources. It takes um, the nicotine replacement therapy. And it's expensive. So there's a handful of successes. We need to look at those. We need to be able to... Um, replicate those in other communities. We're not there yet. And the other thing for us in Indian country, we've had huge success in policies. Our Oregon tribes, there's nine Oregon tribes. We have over 50 policies around public places, around the buildings, around not smoking at events, um, not smoking in the fleets. Our prevalence rates have not gone down like the general population when policy was implemented. So there's, there's something happening there, um, and we need to find out what it is. So we have a lot of work, I feel, to do with tobacco in Indian country. We need to see our rates go down. Um, we need to see more cessation. We need to see more policy. Um, but I, it's, it's still a huge challenge. But I have seen it go somewhere. I've been doing this long enough. Um, there's been points in my life I've gotten so frustrated, and I've had tribal leaders come up to me and go, girl, we used to smoke in these meetings. Come on. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there has definitely been an improvement, but I feel like um, in Indian country, I, I call tobacco, um, it's, it's truly the real Indian killer, tobacco. And, and just so, uh, and I, I don't know the exact number, so on the reservation, what is it compared to off? Um, well, it varies. So... I mean, I work with 43 tribes. I have access to 25 tribal clinic data. We have tribes that have smoking rates as high as 50%. Um, probably the lowest is about 27. Um, so we're still far above the, the national average. And our youth rates are scary. And then dual use for like electronic cigarette, vaping is, is really horrible too, or high. National rate is at 15%. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you mentioned uh, working with HUD, and what is it like, and this is for anybody in the panel, what is it like bringing uh, stakeholders to the table and working with them and, and kind of getting them to understand? What, what is the environment like, and, and how is that, is that working? Rachel, we'll start with you. Uh, that's a great question. I was going to kind of touch base on the last one as well. And Please do. I, I think tobacco, and everyone here in the room, I'm preaching to the choir here, is everyone, I think tobacco is a perfect example of how complex cancer control is, uh, the socio socio-ecological model, the things we face every day, um, human behaviors. And so HUD housing, really, you guys were talking about that multi-prong approach and um, the creation of the, uh, the uh, Smoke-Free Public Housing Task Force that, and that workshop that was put together for states to uh, go to, um, I, it really allowed us to bring different partners to the table that have never had conversations before. Um, and it's not that people weren't doing anything about it, it was looking at the modernized resources. So um, University of Texas that has portable apps to be able to sit down with people and individuals and say, hey, can I sign you up for a cessation class? Can I send that cessation reminder to your provider so that there is accountability? Um, so I think that's a great way to show how all those different partners can, can come together. And I want to say we were talking about policy, and policies are incredible, and that is our goal. But if there's a will, there's a way. And um, we're, we're on a, uh, an agency campus, and um, it is amazing that even state workers, and my, my colleagues here, she can attest to this, is that we have a smoke-free campus. Um, we have universities that are smoke-free. And let me tell you, smokers will find a way to find that one plot, and you will drive to work at 7 in the morning or walk, you'll try and take a nice walk around the campus to get your little steps in, and they are on the, they're like balancing on the sidewalk because they know this one spot, and you, they will have five people there, and they know, and they will be standing. Sometimes I just want to, I know you shouldn't shame, but I almost want to get my camera out and say, you're standing right next to the smoke-free campus sign, and those are people that are in our field that are supposed to be champions. And so that shows how complex one tobacco is, um, but just cancer prevention control in a whole. And so, and I know we all have our little behaviors that <laughs> we probably don't want to test to, but yeah, that it is a complex environment and that's just tobacco. That's not talking about HPV vaccinations or screening rates in rural areas or even frontiers in Texas, so. <laughs> And, and did you want to answer the question about the, oh, you, you did a little well, bit. I but. did in the beginning about how bringing those um, different uh, stakeholders to the table to discuss different policies. And it was incredible. And I'm sure there are a lot of people here that were a part of that workshop, um, how quickly they had to act. Um, because when did the HUD rule go into effect? It was like this June, July? or August, okay, <laughs> I'm like hearing different months out there. And so within, yeah, in August they had to be there and people got together and put that into action. And it was amazing to see something move so quickly and so successfully. And it's gonna be really exciting to see within the next year how that implementation um, takes place. You mentioned walking that fine line. I think when she was talking, I immediately went to the airport and I mean, when you walk by and, and you see the, the smoking little area of the room yeah. and, and you see like, like, like 75 people crammed in that small space. And I walk by and I just think, I said, man, smoking must be good. <laughs> I mean, obviously it's not, but I mean, these are grown adults just basically falling on each other to smoke. In, in proximity, I mean, that, that's what I thought about when I talked about, like, you know, you mentioned like straddling that line and, and doing that. Does anybody else want to attack the answer of uh, the question of the uh, stakeholders? Yes. No, I think, um, I think it's really about, um, so, you know, cancer is the leading cause of death in Massachusetts. It surpassed heart disease and stroke, year, you know, years ago. And I think really um, bringing stakeholders to feel as though um, that we can do something about the burden of cancer in Massachusetts and um, really um, helping them feel that they have input into projects 
Um, and we have to, um, keeping stakeholders at the table is also about um, having tangible outcomes, not just meeting for the sake of meeting. Um, and one of the other things that we did is um, for our new cancer state plan is um, we actually um, took pictures, sorry, um, pictures of our stakeholders and quotes and actually put that in our state cancer plan so that they would see themselves in this cancer state plan. This is their cancer state plan. And for other people to pick up the, you know, and say, oh, I, I know this person. And to be, well, if they're part of this, that adds le legitimate um, to what the work we're doing. So I think it's really, it's about that. It's bringing um, the passion, but also the practic practical side of it, of getting things done and being able to show that you're able to, um, to um, do things that have meaning and that you can use the data to show that you've had an impact, short term and long term, so. As far as stakeholders go, I don't think I'm alone in saying that bringing groups of people together on top of what they already do is really, really hard. And so I think I have two quick things that I'm sure y'all do, but have been important for us at Colorado, in Colorado is leveraging those other partnerships. For example, at the beginning of the um, Cancer Coalition in Colorado, we leveraged our breast and cervical cancer program and grew from there. Uh, and then another just small tidbit uh, that we've done is asked organizations and really put some templates out there to um, add uh, into job descriptions of our partner organizations uh, participation in in, in coalitions, and specifically the Cancer Coalition, when it makes sense. And those are two small things that we've done to try to, to, to grow our, our stakeholders and get the right people. HUD, you know, it's some of those, um, those partnerships that we wouldn't have thought of 20 years ago, uh, that kind of helps there. Uh, I want to say for, for the state of North Carolina, um, I'm the, the manager for our comprehensive cancer program. Um, to answer the question about stakeholders, I really, um, with our team and even with our, our, our branch head, what we do with Comp Cancer in North Carolina, we make sure we convey that message of our leadership role first is the connector and identifying ways on how to make connections so we can be able to leverage resources and leverage funds and uh, maximize on what we're able to do and our, our casting our reach um, um, more deeply than, you know, hitting on that surface level. And, and at the risk of sounding like a, a little PSA spot, but it's the truth, using our cancer plan as our anchor and bringing us back to that whenever we get in conversations or when we start trying to identify and pull in or engage in uh, someone new or some of those non-traditional partners that you would never even think about. Um, we have a project, I'll, I'll mention that a little bit one, with one of our other um, things we'll talk about, but just one piece of um, looking at lung cancer and radon, we actually connected with the Realtors Association in North Carolina. Someone you wouldn't even think about cancer, but the anchor there was that cancer plan and the strategies and priorities that we've identified in that. But then when we talk with those different partners, it's about sitting down and having that, that honest conversation of, this is what the issue is. Either you have the audience that needs to get the messaging, that needs to take action, or either you have the mechanism for helping them to connect to what they need. So let's see how we can come up with a common goal here on how we can be collaborators and not competitors, as well as how we can maximize on what we both need to get done on the greater good of, of reducing that um, cancer burden. Um, misconceptions about cancer. I mean, uh, you, we mentioned smoking being the, the detriment that it is. I, I have conversations with people, and, and, I, and I, I believe I know somewhat of the science that may or may not be true. But you, you have conversations with people, and they say, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm black. I don't have to wear sunscreen. <laughs> or, or this is not going to impact me. I, I can eat this, and I'm going to be fine. This is not a problem. Uh, I think we're learning more and more that we're all connected to a certain degree. Uh, I, I think back to an ABC News special that I saw a story years ago where they showed how dermatologists go on vacation. And you know how we, we, we love the sun and we go out and we can't wait to get to the beach and we can't wait to get out there and take all our clothes off and lay on the beach. 
uh, these people were all covered up in hats, in, in sweatshirts, and basically sun go away. So I thought that was very interesting to see that. And it changed my view of vacation ever since that time. But I mean, what misconceptions and in, in what people should and should not. Well, now I was gonna say, you as a um, public spokesperson, you could help us <laughs> with <laughs> well, that. Uh, no, that's I'm what I'm here to do. No. So we just did um, some message testing around primary prevention related to um, obesity. And, and it was amazing, and the tie, the, so there's increasing knowledge um, I do think, and one of the, the challenges in doing this message testing is for people saying, well, um, there's particularly in certain um, groups and culture, you know, it's, well, it's, it's, um, it's my fate, you know, nothing I can do about it, it's genetic. And there's a growing knowledge, um, I don't have to say this, preaching to the choir here, but, you know, that um, obesity-related cancer is huge and it really is something people can do something about. So we did some message testing just recently to find out what resonates with people, those best messages. Um, but that's a really important important um, part of cancer as we go into the, the next 20 years. And great to get some of that knowledge because we found that the people um, doing the testing, the change in their knowledge was huge I mean, in terms of what they knew and, and then knew at the end of the, the message testing. So we'd love for some people in the mainstream media to start talking about the connection between um, that part of the lifestyle and cancer. So I think that's important. Um, I think that one misconception that we're working on in our state is that once somebody has been diagnosed with cancer and they use tobacco, that it's a bad time for them to quit because they're stressed out, they just had this diagnosis that was terrible. But the science behind it shows that, and preaching to the choir here, but that chemotherapy works better and treatment works better if you can encourage them to quit smoking during their treatment. Uh, so one of the programs that we work on in Michigan is we've worked with um, our Michigan Oncology Quality Consortium, and we have enrolled over 25 oncology uh, provider offices to do automatic referrals for anybody that says that they smoke, cancer survivor or anyone in treatment, they get automatically referred to our tobacco quit line. So to date, we've enrolled over 4,000 cancer patients and survivors um, with a 25% quit rate for that uh, population. So we're really proud of that. You know, that's such a mind shift because I think you just said that people who are, who are, are diagnosed with lung cancer think it's a bad time to quit. I think that pe that... Uh, sometimes doctors, providers might say this is not a good time for the patient to quit with any kind of cancer because they need it to cope with the stress of going through treatment. I don't know, have any of you heard that? Yeah. Well, and I think there's misconceptions, but I think there's a, a bigger issue for, I mean, I, re I have, really have been doing this a long time. Um, and I, when I first started doing even work with policy and tobacco prevention, it's like, I can't feed my family. I don't have a place to live. Um, I can't afford the medicine I need for my mom or my child. So I think there's a, a priority thing that happens. Um, and I think in Native communities, I, I also worked in the women's health program at NARA, so I've kind of spanned different projects. I wrote the Comprehensive Cancer Grant at the Indian Health Board. I left and went to NARA and ran the Women's Health Program, and so I sat on the coalition um, and helped write the cancer plan and saw it from the other side and sat on the advisory board. But I think there's a lot of um, issues. We've talked about social determinants. Um, one of the things, I mean, smoking, alcoholism, all those things are also tied to, there's not been much mention of historical trauma. Um, and I think there's a way to turn that around and talk about resiliency. But I think those are things in the communities we're trying to address, if you're talking about health equity, that um, are a part of social determinants. But those are things we really do have to pay attention to. And I mean, I'm the first one to focus on Let's get a curriculum. Let's look at healthy lifestyles. Let's look at the, you know, I have my little Fitbit here. I was running up the stairs last night at 11 o'clock to get my 10 flights. Um, but if you can't get out of bed and put your tennis shoes on, 
um, because your life is too hard and too complicated, we have to go down a different layer. Um, and for me, after 20 years of being with this grant, I really have heard initially like talking about cancer even was not the norm. I mean, my tribal communities now have prevention programs, have survivor programs. Um, so I have, I have seen things go a long way. Um, but I think there's some base problems that really need to be addressed and we're, we're getting there slowly but surely. And I just realized I have to make one clarity because I've been doing this long enough. When I talk about tobacco, I'm talking about commercial um, tobacco because in our tribal communities, there's uh, tobacco still used in ceremony and in prayer. Um, so I want to make sure that that's clear. I didn't say that up front, and I usually do. Uh, I'll, I'll just um, make, make my short and just, in a sense, kind of piggyback. I, I agree with everyone that's spoken already. But um, part of what we've, we've also been able to actually start seeing some momentum and, and some leverage in North Carolina, it, it goes back to what you were saying initially. It's about how you tell that story. Um, and it's about being action oriented. So we, we try to stay on that mindset in North Carolina. Instead of just doing things to help raise awareness, it's about how do we shift that mindset or connect to that mindset to actually move them into action, to actually do something, even if it's just one thing that they take ownership of and do. We actually um, came together uh, in our chronic disease injury section at the State Department of Health, and we um, did a big collaborative and did a media campaign toolkit. Uh, and that included our tobacco branch. That included our um, uh, nutrition and physical activity branch and diabetes and um, you know, all of those that fall under that chronic disease umbrella. And we put together a, a toolkit for communities to be able to use, but we went from that, that message of not just leading with cancer or leading with those chronic diseases, but leading with um, making it more personal. And we called it um, be there for your family. Uh, and being there for your family and the messaging, the, the commercial spots, the different videos, the different print materials, it was very personal. It was families. It was families with kids. It was single parents. It was, you know, that, that, that gentleman that, you know, may have maybe a single parent, that type of thing. But it's like, you want to be there for your family or life is too short. You want to be there for those special moments in your life. So everything connected to, the, to that visually, but then the takeaway was, what is it that you need to do? And if it's to get in and get that prevention, it's to focus on those behavioral risk factors they're talking about. If it's about um, getting those screenings, what have you, that was those quick takeaways. So if they didn't get anything else, they got those key points. But it was really that the way kind of shifting how you tell that story, especially with how the environment is now and everything is so electronic and you know we can't do it the same old way we used to. When you first um, asked that question, the first thing I thought of was when we had our coalition, um, we had survivorship panel. And um, I think a very common thing you hear is, it's never gonna happen to me. I can't believe it happened to me. And I also think there's the other spectrum of the, the odds, the statistics, and a lot of people are like, well, you know, the odds are high. I'm probably gonna get cancer. Sometime, who knows when, maybe when I'm 80. And then I also thought of the media, when we're talking about the media and the crazy thing about the chocolate and the wine, you hear stories on the news of a 110-year-old lady gets interviewed and they said, you know, how, how are you so, you're still alive, you're thriving. A cigarette every day. <laughs> yeah, a cigarette, a cigarette and whiskey every day. And then you Don't hear of stories, <laughs> it is, yeah, you hear of those all the time in every different state and she's like, yeah, that's, you know, that's what got me through it, that's, you know, what made me healthy. And then you hear stories of someone's never picked up a drink, has never smoked a cigarette, and you know they end up having lung cancer. And so I think a big issue that we have, and there's so many, there's a variety of misconceptions because you know, especially with HPV, um, cervical cancer, it's never going to happen to me, and then it does. And so I think cancer, we call it, it's you know, a form of chronic disease for a reason. We focus on primary prevention, screening. Um, survivorship, because it is a lifestyle, it is long term, and you don't know when it's going to impact you. But that also makes so many issues on why it's not a priority. And um, so basically, in short, um, 
my point is, is that this is just something that I think, I, I think a big movement now is having those champions and talking to doctors and tr training our new MDs and new um, primary physicians and uh, medical assistants on how to have those conversations and know who you're talking to. Um, because my mother's a nurse, she is probably her the worst advocate for herself, doesn't go in and get screening. And, and so we as individuals, again, it comes to your behaviors and understanding what you need to do for yourself and what are your risks. And so there are so many misconceptions, I don't know where we can even get started. And I, I, last thing on this, unless you guys want to go any more on this, I, I see the commercial all the time, and it's a smoking commercial, and, and obviously it's meant to hammer home the point, but the person is talking through their throat with the, with the machine. And, and when, you, when you see that, do you say, that hammers home the point? Is, is, that, is that the no-brainer, or are you, do you see that, and you said people still don't get it after that? I mean... I, like me as someone that is not a smoker, I see that and I was like, oh my gosh, how could anyone want to pick up a cigarette after that? But I've also seen people that have smoked cigarettes through that. <laughs> so there, there is a thing of um, when you're looking at something, uh, how you take in that media. Um, and I think we know as public health professionals that we are targeting to specific populations. We are not going to hit a home run. Um, we are going to have gaps, and that is our biggest issue. Our biggest goal is to focus on those gaps, and those gaps change every year. Um, and so looking at taking those wins where we can have them, and so you hope that that hits home, but I think a lot of people see that. They walk away. They mute the TV, and so... Um. It's not a cookie-cutter approach. It, it, it really is, when we say multi-prong, it literally is different lanes on the highway. <laughs> and each lane is a different way to get to that same point. And everybody's going to take different lanes. And so we have to be creative on our end or strategic on our end of, okay, we need everybody to get there, but we got five different lanes we got to go to. So how do we switch it up? for who it is that's gonna travel down those lanes. And that's what keeps us constantly shifting and, and bobbing and weaving, so to speak, and, and really thinking about those partners and how we can strategically figure out the different ways we can go down those different lanes. It's not cookie cutter. And I, I, before, I, I mentioned my astonishment with the fact that there was no national cancer plan um, right now. In terms of state and federal funding, how does that play a role in your priorities and, and what you can do? I guess I'll start since I feel like I'm maybe the most newbie person. Um, so from we have never received state funds for our comprehensive cancer control program. Um, that is to our, our program itself. Um, we have the tobacco branch. Um, we have the breast and cervical cancer program and the Texas Cancer Registry, and they do receive um, because there's a requirement on their part to match funds. Um, and so that is a very complex process for us because we heavily, we'll, we solely rely on this amazing grant, um, the 1701. And so we have to really figure out how to leverage those funds to the best of our ability, what's going on using our coalition using the new workshops, the task force that we have to understand what is being done and how can we build off of that. And so we look at what is being done in chronic disease. So in Northeast Texas, is there an obesity program that is being conducted in um, Northeast Texas because we know that obesity is connected with cancer? Okay, let's all put our efforts into there since we have such slim efforts and Texas is ginormous. Um, so we leverage funds that way. Um, I was, and I'm sure a lot of you in here were probably um, waiting our seats to go back next week or sometimes this month to see the possible new funding opportunities that are out. And so Texas in the past has received um, CDC cervical and prostate um, funding for grants. Unfortunately, we solely only get this grant right now. So we are looking for the future on what possibilities there are. Um, but you kind of have to look at where you are now and what you can do. And so with a program of two people, um, you really hike up your pants and <laughs> get to work. <laughs> and so it's nice, I think, um, 
leveraging funds, but also leveraging your fellow partners and fellow uh, awardees and to be able to sit here and say, okay, you're not alone, but how are you getting over that hurdle? Um, and I think that's why coming together to events like this is incredible to be able to learn from each other and know that, you know, sometimes it's hard because it's like, oh, we're all facing the same challenges. Oh, we haven't faced that or, or we haven't gotten over that hurdle yet, but we're all doing it together. And so I guess resources come in all sorts of ways and <laughs> not always money. <laughs> I mean, I think in, um, for us, you know, um, when I first started, so I've been doing this for about 10 years, and, and I always had to think of an eleva elevator speech, right? <laughs> At least tell people what I did for a living. <laughs> so, um, so it was always, and what I understood from um, the wonderful folks um, uh, who are project officers, and that, it's reducing the burden of cancer. So when we've, um, we no longer, we did have, we had prostate, we had, colorectal, we had a lot of state funding, we had separate CDC funding, and now we're down to a very, you know, much smaller amount for comp cancer. And so it's really, for us to think about where are the gaps um, and where there's a room for us to have the best impact. And and again, it's always about the burden. So we, we're thinking a lot about um, our priorities, and we think about you know, I mean, that's, I think, the challenge for cancer is so many body types, different types of cancer. So we really had to go back to what are our top cancers in Massachusetts and how can we make the biggest impact. So, for example, um, prostate cancer, um, when I started in 2008, the mortality rate for black men was, is twice that of white men. It's, that has barely moved come to, to 10 years later. So we are starting to really think about, um, it's not a screening issue, well it could be, but we're really focused on um, treatment. And so we're looking at where are we doing a lot of progress, let keep that going with our partners, but really go to the areas where there isn't a lot of being done. So we're now um, doing the deep dive into treatment issues. We have really high screening rates in Massachusetts. We have some of the highest screening rates. We really need to look at, and so comp cancer is starting to really think about how can we impact um, a real sort of unknown area for us, which is around um, treatment um, for prostate cancer. So we're working with, um, we're looking to um, harnessing those fellows, those um, new residents and other people to do the work for us. Um, so they really need, and they need to write papers. That's great. That's a, what, what it's in for them. So we're doing a um, real comprehensive view of um, the registry data using some of our partners to actually do the work and just supporting that. So I think it's, it's really looking at that. And for us, um, it really gets back to the biggest burden is, is the disparities that's happening, even in our state with, you know, with other resources. So... I think that um, leveraging and flexibility are things that we are expert at, experts at, at in this room, I would have to say. And um, one of the ways we do that in the state of Colorado is we have a tobacco tax fund that was uh, increased, that was passed in 2006. So um, used to when, when I used to say cancer plan implementation funds, I would just laugh because those don't exist. Can, I mean, how many... We're a state, too, that doesn't have any uh, state funding for comp cancer. So I've had to shift my mindset on what we can use as cancer plan implementation funds because you have the breast and cervical cancer screening program, and in our state we're lucky enough to have the um, colorectal cancer screening program. But really the comprehensive cancer program, it, and we're not even here yet in Colorado, but this is what I would like to see, is really the, the, the base, the backbone of all the cancer work that we do in the state. And our cancer coalition is really the hub of all that work. Can I say it functions beautifully all the time? Nope. Can I say we ebb and flow and maybe had to do a complete org reorganization two years ago? Perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, but I think taking off, allowing our, and, and this could be modeled too, I think by our partners and by the CDC, is taking off our whatever blinders it is you have on, maybe it's breast and cervical cancer bl blinders, maybe it's colorectal cancer control program blinders, and really opening it up and seeing that these are all cancer plan implementation dollars, and the comprehensive cancer program really has a lot of power. So balancing that, that power on having the, the comprehensive cancer folks really be the umbrella or the bottom of the pyramid or whatever however you want to draw it or make it look, um, because we, we can push this together as long as we're all 
rowing in the same direction. And so I think no matter what state funds you get or federal funds you get or tobacco tax you did or didn't get or whether or not you still or never got tobacco settlement agreement monies. <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to talk about that? Um, it, it, it's flexibility and leverage and really empowering our coalitions and our the comp cancer program in general to to empower the other programs and really fall in line with with uh, you know the evidence based practices that we're trying to do. I was just going to say one other quick thing. I mean, we're I go around saying that we're a convener of people and. Um, so when we um, knew that we were going to sort of have a significant reduction in funding and talking to our steering committee and a lot of, <laughs> um, you know, I said, this, this is where we're at right now. This is a very uncertain time for federal funding. I said, so I brought out um, my staff. I always laugh when I do this. But so in Boston, we have the Longfellow Bridge. And Longfellow Bridge is this great bridge that goes way, way back. And it's built on these really massive stone pillars. And they just renovate, they just, I run across the bridge every day, and it's a really magnificent bridge. So I said to our partners, you know, funds may come and go, um, but our partners and the, the partnership, that's the Longfellow Bridge, and that's sustained, you know, hurricanes and floods and snowstorms. And so we need to preserve the partnership, and that's what. It's different about comp cancer, I think, than any other program in our Department of Public Health. It's really hard to explain, it's hard to measure, but it's very powerful. And so I said it's power of the partnerships. That is what we need to sustain and build upon, even with the funding difficulties. I, I just want to say real quick, um, our, I actually love our comprehensive cancer plan because I sat on the other side and was in the meeting where we created a cancer-free world in our tribal communities. And it was really awesome. Um, so that plan was really built out of the tribes that were sitting there, um, the state programs that were sitting in there. And actually, I have three state partners sitting in the room I want to acknowledge, because my, my state partners work well with me. So Idaho, Oregon, and Washington are all here, and, and I have great partnerships <laughs> with them. Um, but. When, when our plan was all said and done, it was a lot different than the other plans. Um, I think initially CDC actually hated the, um, it's called the, the Comprehensive Tribal 20-Year Cancer Plan. But the vision in the plan was really um, looking out s seven generations for where we want to be. We were new to the game, so we took basically the tobacco template and we threw in the kitchen sink. But it got us a long way. Um, I sit on the National HPV Roundtable because we were the only cancer program that had HPV in our cancer plan. But when you talk about doing a national program, so my, my plan is for my 43 tribes. I have a resolution that they support it. I have five tribes that have, had, have developed their own cancer plans. So you all are talking about 50 states. We're talking about 562 tribes. <laughs> so. Um, maybe the seven tribal programs could sit down and, you know, come together and do a cancer-free Native community. Chris has done a great little infographic that I stole, and I love it, the American Indian Cancer Foundation. Um, but a national Indian plan? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I'll just add uh, one more little small tidbit with it, um, with everything that everyone said. It's, it's just wonderful to hear the different states and what everybody's been doing. Um, in North Carolina, our, our cancer coalition has three components. We've got our advisory committee uh, that I told you where um, uh, the General Assembly mandates and, and, and makes sure that we keep it staffed. But then we also have our cancer partnership component, and that's where we bring in a a huge host of other partners from across the state, whether they be non-traditional partners, non-profits, um, you name it. Uh, we've got those cancer survivors, uh, caregivers, that type of thing. And then we have uh, our cancer prevention and control branch. And under that umbrella of the branch, we have our three programs, which is our breast and cervical cancer control program, 
um, Comp Cancer Program, as well as the Wise Woman Project. Uh, and having the leadership, um, Debbie Nelson, our, our branch head, she's here with me, the kind of support that she provides, it helps us to be able to really stay true to that vision of um, um, really merging those partnerships and leveraging for the resources. Um, uh, we're fortunate to have the funding that we do from, from CDC, but we also have a very small pot um, that we get from uh, because the General Assembly um, does support and, and su you know, supports what we're doing and the efforts of implementing our cancer plan. Uh, so that at least helps for some of the smaller things, like some of our educational component to implement the cancer plan. Um, but we did, re we did experience or had the impact of um, funding loss with the grant uh, from what we previously had. But because of, of what, what we're doing here, we couldn't lose momentum. It was, it was a, a true moment for us to really stop and, and have to refocus, you know, re-looking at our scope of work, re-looking at uh, our agenda and our priorities, and really prioritizing even more so um, to make sure that we're not just checking off boxes to say we did something, but how can we still make the greater impact? Who else can we pull to the table to help us with some of these gaps that we're experiencing? Because that also, unfortunately, we lost staffing. Um, but again, it's, it's all at how we work together and how we work together with those partners. And they understand that because they're vested in the cancer plan itself being that anchor and vested in what we're doing as far as, as sort of leading that, that ship, so to speak, because a cancer plan is not just for us, it's for the whole state. So we really spend that time now really not only being that leadership and making the connections, but also working to equip others, other organizations, other networks, other coalitions, even if they pull out just small components of it, of the cancer plan, to use, use it for their work and their efforts of how do they prioritize with the small monies that they may have. And we might not be able to bring them funding, but we can at least be able to give them that technical guidance to be able to sort of define where they're going and be an extension of what we're doing at the state level. Ladies, thank you very much for your passionate fight. We appreciate you. Round of applause, please, for our great awardees panel. Crystal Borwood, Gail Merriam, Angela McFall, Karen Lopez, Ava Crawford, and Rachel Coughlin. Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have our CDC panel. So please give it up for Lori Graff. That's right. The CDC is in the building. We have Corinne Graff under. That's right. But we're not finished. We have Judy Hannon coming up next. The wonderful and talented Nikki Hayes, please. And without further ado, Lisa Richardson. Thank you very much. Ladies, we appreciate you as always. Good to have a quick conversation with you before we started. And um, before I start, I thought it was very interesting that at, we were talking that Atlanta is, is not a comprehensive smoke-free city. And if, if we can start with that and in, in what that means in the bigger picture. I can start. <laughs> <laughs> I can start. So for the definition we use for comprehensive cancer is smoke-free restaurants, bars, and workplaces. And so in Atlanta right now, any of you that live in Atlanta, there's a campaign underway. The American Cancer Society plays a big role. The Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids plays a big role. Americans for Non-Smokers' Rights plays a big role. But we're one of the you know, we're one of, I think, probably a small number of very large cities that is still not a comprehensive smoke-free, which means that people that are living here and working here are not having the same protections that other um, cities provide for their, for their citizens. So if you have any opportunity and you live in Atlanta to show up or volunteer, go on a website, there's, there's a lot of work that's being done right now, and we're, we're hopeful. And I would just say that 
if we can do this through our comprehensive cancer control networks, our tobacco control networks, our national networks, if we can do this in New Orleans and we can make New Orleans a smoke-free city, surely we can make Atlanta a smoke-free city. That's right. That's right. And actually, for those, so Nikki, that's a great point, because for those of you that don't know the New Orleans story, one of the most effective strategies, you guys were just talking about the use of partners and unusual partnerships. They in New Orleans were extremely effective in reaching into and working with the musicians in the city of New Orleans who have lived, you know, many of them non-smokers who have done their, and spent their entire professional careers having to work in environments where they were constantly being exposed to and getting cancer, I mean, not cancer, but not necessarily cancer, but smoking-related diseases and conditions from their workplace exposure and they mobilize those musicians to say enough enough we don't we don't we shouldn't have to experience this and so th- so that was a really powerful unusual partnership that led to in part not always out not all they also had an amazing remarkable champion um but but they definitely were able to, and they and even their casino is smoke free they went completely 100% smoke free including the city's casino so it's a really powerful model for for other cities and, and Dr. Richardson, we'll start with you. What have been some of the, uh, the key lessons in establishing the uh, comprehensive cancer control? Well, I think it's been, it's been, well, I know it has been said multiple times um, today and on each panel and probably yesterday and this morning, it's all about partnerships. It's all about the coalitions um, out there in the field. Um, it's all about who you bring to the table to get this work done. And we all have an interest in cancer control because we've all been impacted by it. And I would say that it's, and the coalitions, you all have just done this remarkably over the past 20 years, but putting aside or being willing to put aside your own individual agendas and work together to reach this common goal. And and that, to me, I think is one of the biggest keys of the success that we've seen over the years. And so what happens probably when you're in Indiana and you see these complete streets and you have these these opportunities to, 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 to walk, to bike, to run in your community because um, you, you appreciate that. You don't necessarily know that the comprehensive cancer control stakeholders and and the other and other players in the city or in the in the county or the community came together and made this happen. You just know that you have a better lifestyle. And so, for for us as individuals to be able to put aside, um, you know, our own individual agendas and come together and achieve these common goals, I think it's extremely rewarding. But it's absolutely what has to happen. Um, and I guess I would offer some perspective on the key lessons in establishing. Um, definitely the partnership um, was key, uh, but I'd offer uh, sort of two other things, uh, being around the table when it first uh, was formed. Learning what works. So there was a great effort before comprehensive cancer control actually became a thing at CDC that was looking at where are a few states that have had some kind of plan, what have they done, what have been the plans that have seemed to have some success more than just being on the shelf. Um, and so the sort of literature review, the studying that, and the bringing that together and say, so what are, what are the plans that seem successful have? So I'd offer um, uh, being here at CDC um, it, and early in my career, it was really helpful to see that study what works, especially in the field. Um, this concept that here in Atlanta we sort of know what's what to do. Not The only reason we know what to do is because we may have studied what you all are doing out in the States. Um, and then I, I think the being creative um, is another huge piece. But I would offer that I, I think um, the division got it right um, by working very um, diligently at the beginning to establish comprehensive cancer control with ACS, NCI, with the rest of the partners that you see here. Um, there were some interesting conversations at the beginning that I'm sure you all as states have also gone through, which is the who owns it. Um, and the few people at the beginning that helped put it together just had an absolute commitment that it was jointly owned, um, and you watched that in, in action. Um, and so I think the um, learning from the states, studying what works, and then trying to put a framework together and support that is absolutely essential. 
So I agree completely with what Judy just said. The thing that I think I remember the most from the really early days, even before the 1998 um, beginning of your timeline, um, was that there was this report that, that was generated that really laid out what is what's helpful, what's necessary, what needs to be considered, where are there barriers, et cetera. And it, and it was really by having that analysis and having that assessment that we were able to say, okay, what would it look like to start to implement this? But as it has already also been said, there was no money. There was no resources. There was no funding. There was no actual real staff. Um, I think I was probably one of the only, if not the only person who kind of got dedicated to doing this more as a more of a percentage of my job than most um, everyone else's. And the, but what I, what I would call out in addition to the things that um, Judy just called out and what everybody else has already called out is that there was also just at that time, there was a remarkable commitment to leadership in the cancer control area. And I just had a colleague recently say to me, management focuses on getting th things done right. Leadership focuses on doing the right things. And I think at that time, there was re a real clear commitment. This was the right thing to do. And like you said, not everybody even knew exactly why, but it was just that there was, there was a lot of um, dissatisfaction in the idea that we knew we could do better than, and don't take this the wrong way, but just focusing on BNC. Or just, you know, that we knew as a public health agency we could do better, and we didn't know how we were gonna get there. We knew we couldn't get there alone. We had to have partners. And we didn't know if it would ever be funded, but we knew we had to give it a shot. And so there was, a, there was that beginning cobbling together of the staff, cobbling together of some dollars and resources to, to start to make an investment and build on that investment. And I think that's something I've care. I've, you know, I've left cancer a long time ago. I've been in a lot of different programs here at CDC. There are lots of people who work for cancer and then end up in lots of different positions all over CDC. And those are things and lessons that I have taken with me every single additional program that I've ever worked with, every policy effort that I've ever been involved with, we really just carry those with us, so. Wow, <laughs> I thought I had some great answers and then Judy <laughs> spoke and, and Corinne spoke, so what am I going to say? Um, I, I think, uh, again, doing what the division does well was one of the key lessons in assembling those stakeholders. And it says on the screen I'm a former CDC employee, and, and I am, but I'm going back even farther than that when I was a program director for the breast and cervical cancer program and a chronic disease director. And I remember after a National Conference, there was an ancillary meeting, and the concept and the definition of comprehensive cancer control was um, shared with, with the program directors and the chronic disease directors. And um, one of the, the questions that they asked, well, what do you think about this? What do you think is the feasibility of coordinating cancer prevention and control efforts? Or what do you see as the positive aspects? And more importantly, what do you see as maybe some of the stumbling blocks? So um, we feel that not only only did they listen to the national partners like ACS and, and other and uh, the Commission on Cancer, but the, but uh, the division also listened to us as people in the field, and because of that, I think we helped. Um, maybe not develop, but helped refine some of the things like the comprehensive cancer control framework, the essential elements, the building blocks, and the planning model. Um, question here, and, and listening to you all speak. And, and the passion involved moves me. Uh, and this is off script here, but I, you know, th that's okay. I, how has working in the cancer field impacted you? How has it changed you personally? I'll start, and, and I'll say this. I, I absolutely, absolutely hate cancer. Um, it is, it's a nasty monster, and we all have experienced that, you know, with loved ones, with, you know, each other, and so it, it's a monster. Um, but when there are time, there are times that we get it right. And so for me, and this is so, I mean, it's, 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 it's almost comical. Um, but my youngest is 18. Um, when the HPV vaccination came out, I took her to get vaccinated. I had to beg my doctor, um, you know, at the first visit to give her the shot. I had to beg them to schedule the second dose. I had to beg them to schedule the third dose. But 
you know, and I, and I tell this story often, um, but just like any other teenager who is always more so engaged in her phone and every other thing about her life than her parents, we're sitting around watching TV and she's doing all of this Snapchatting and whatnot and the Merck Did You Know commercial comes on TV. And she's sitting there, and she's doing this and that, and then she looks at the TV, and she glares, and then she glares at me, and she was like, did you know that? And I, <laughs> I was so proud to say, girl, yes, you got that shot already. <laughs> Remember, that's the one that hurt me. And she was like, oh, okay, thank you. But, <laughs> but, you know, just that little win, you know, just to be able to say, this work does make a difference. And, and, and to be able to really relate it to something that's as real as my 15-year-old sitting there trying to shame me, but she didn't get to, because I actually did what I was supposed to have done to me is, you know, that's my personal experience. So I would have to add on to what Nikki just said. You know, for me as well, I'm an oncologist, a medical doctor that treats cancer. And so people are always asking, oh, well, you know, what is it about? It's a horrible thing. But I'll tell you, I saw something on LinkedIn the other day that was talking about a doctor um, whose patient walked up to him in the grocery store, and he's been after him for 20 years to quit smoking. And he said, you know what? I finally quit, right? And so really for me, it's like my conflict as a person that works as a cancer doctor and then works in prevention is the population versus the individual conflict constantly, right? But at the end of the day, we're going to make the biggest, biggest difference in cancer working at the population level. But all of us have to remember that they're not just numbers, they're individual people. And that's what I preach all the time. No matter how many stats you have, each, each stat are individual people that we have to remember that we're here uh, to serve them. Go ahead. Well, I was just, I, I just, so for me, I can't, so I've been here at CDC this year, 31 years. And so when I came, behavioral health and behavioral science wasn't even really the emphasis. I mean, this is still, and it certainly was then very much an infectious disease, epidemiology organization. It's very, very science-based, but very, very epidemiology-based, which is, I'm, again, not criticizing. This is what I've grown up in, and this is what I know and love. And, and But I think cancer, and just even working in the, in the chronic disease space, has given me just this remarkable opportunity over a career of 31 years to really understand how we think differently about the leading drivers of health and disease and disability. And I started with health for the same reason you started with health, is that because, you know, ultimately, aspirationally, that's what everyone wants. Everyone wants their, themselves to be healthy, their families, their children. And we, but we know their communities have to also be healthy, which is, gets to what Lisa's saying. We know that it's not sufficient to just focus on the individuals. We've got to focus on those things that drive health and, and reward or disincentivize health within the communities and within context. So I learned I was just fortunate to be in this organization in this time and in this kind of cancer space. And, and actually, I have to just share with one other thing. It's been really interesting to be in this room today because my in the mid-90s, I was in the office on smoking and health and left the office on smoke to go to the Div Division of Cancer Prevention and Control. And then I was in, and, and that's when California was just, pa you know, passing the first comprehensive and, and, t and tobacco, I mean, and the first taxes had been, I mean, there was so much going on in, in tobacco and cancer and, you know, just chronic diseases. And then come, you know, fast forward the last three years as the director of the Office on Smoking and Health, it's a very different place to be in. People don't even recognize tobacco as being a problem anymore. They think we've got that solved, and we don't. We've still got a lot of work to be done. It's, it, there is a lot of difference in the political will. We, they're talking about Native Americans. I mean, I was just in Minnesota. Some of those tribes are 50 to 60 percent adult prevalence rate still. So it's a remarkable um, challenge, but it's also a remarka remarkable opportunity. And I think we still have to stay focused on the opportunity. Um, and I guess I would offer. Um, Working in the Division for Cancer um, Prevention and Control, I, I'm sure there were days, I, can, I don't work there anymore, so I can only think fondly of it, um, that, I, that I didn't feel this way. But the work really matters. Um, and uh, a few of the lessons that I feel like I've taken with me throughout my career at CDC, 
the power of a few individuals, and I'm looking at some of them now, um, to really make a difference, um, to have a dream, to think there's another way we can do this, public health can be better than this, um, and to roll up their sleeves and figure it out and gather a few other people. And then you add the flip side to that, and where I see comprehensive cancer control being today in all states and um, many uh, tribes and territories, um, and realize that it, there's this really interesting um, dance that you have to do from having a few people really focused on it, being able to figure out what to do, and then how do you institutionalize that? How do you bring it out to the nation? Um, both of those are lessons that I've definitely taken with me and that I um, use in my um, current works in cardiovascular health. Um, you asked about what I uh, impact working in cancer has had on, on us. And I have to go back to the first job I had in public health, and that was the nurse administrator of a local public health agency. So I was out there taking care of patients who were dying of colon cancer, uh, young mothers who were diagnosed with breast cancer, who had twins, and, and um, also people with lung cancer who could not breathe. And so, as Nikki said, I grew to hate cancer. And so as I had the opportunities through the years to find a way to be um, to take that passion of, of hate and turn it into something positive. Um, and so I think that's, that's what has driven me all these years in being in uh, cancer prevention and control and why I got so excited about comprehensive cancer control because it was that way to work with a number of people, to coordinate, to cooperate, to collaborate in, in dealing with this most terrible disease. Thank you for your answers. I appreciate that. Um, you know, back when this all got started and you were in various places, what were the, the, the challenges and problems getting this off the ground and, and how have those been uh, either bridged or, 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 or is the gap still there? I'll offer as being one of the old <laughs> oldies. Um, Not at all. No, no, no. <laughs> Um, being one of the people who were around as the conversation was happening, one of the most interesting ones was people saying, what is it? Um, that I understand you all still sometimes get. What is comprehensive cancer control? Um, which I think is interesting that the question is still out there and it still deserves um, an answer. Um, and so I think um, because the division of cancer prevention and control got started so much with breast and cervical early detection, and that was so concrete, it's about providing services for women, the concept that you would do something that is not providing services and more thinking and planning was really hard. So there was a, um, a lot of, and Corinna already mentioned, some visionaries who were really like saying, we need to do this, public health can do better. Um, and then being able to support that, whether it was from the study, uh, putting some money aside to be able to study, finding creative ways of funding the initial states that worked before there actually was an FOA or NOFO that gave them money um, to work on comprehensive cancer control. Um, all of that, that sort of entrepreneurial, there's another way we can do this, I think was, was really important in getting things um, started. And then I have to you know, think, and if the idea wasn't good, even if all that framework had done some something good, but if when we went to the field and the other chronic disease directors would have said, you're nuts, this won't fly, I, you know, I don't think we'd be here 20 years later. The fact was, people, it did resonate, and people um, from many partners and within public health being able to say, no, we really, we cancer is a huge thing. And for each state, we probably ought to think about some priorities and think about what we really feasibly can do. Um, and for each of the challenges that uh, people put together, like how do you prioritize, um, the concept, and I, and I can't remember the concept mapping, the concept that there's an answer to it, there is a way to think through whatever the problem is, was part of where I think um, the division was, was just always leaning in to try to figure out, um, and had a reasonable number of partners around the table that could help with that, so we weren't left with just um, the few folks at CDC that were thinking about it. So she's handing it to me because I was the other, I'm the other old timer that was there in the very, 
in the very beginning. Um, so I definitely rem remember that conversation. I think um, maybe not so much a conversation, but I think one of the things that the division did right was that we had early field staff. Again, some, some folks that are in the room that were part of the field staff. So CDC placed assignees into the states. And that was really important because it was so... Um, nascent and there was a lot that needed to be learned and we're not it's hard to keep up with everything that's going on in each individual state but by having those field staff included in those um, early programs I think it gave us a really nice direct way to get um, information and really kind of keep that two-way flow of information going so that as we were hearing from the states and what their experience was, we were able to tweak things and make adjustments. Um, someone mentioned the leadership you know, um, forum that was held, and so we were able to do some of those kinds of things, and I think that really helped um, address in a more, in a more um, cohesive way some of those conversations that, so everybody wasn't having to make up their own answer individually, but they could come together and share and kind of say, well, you know, when you are asked what is this, how do you answer this? Or when you're, when you're struggling with X or Y, what is, you know, how do you approach that? And I think that helped with some of those early challenging conversations about what is this, why are we doing it? Um, you know, some, you know who, should be at, who should be at the table, those kinds of things that have already been mentioned a little bit. Well, I'm one of those field assignees. <laughs> and I think, um, uh, uh, first of all, I'll talk about my pro program director, my chronic disease um, uh, attitude toward comprehensive cancer control, because I was very skeptical to begin with. I really needed to be sold on this. Our state had a healthy, uh, we were working on a healthy state uh, 2010 plan that had a cancer chapter. So why would we absolutely need to have comprehensive cancer control in a ca and a state cancer plan? But uh, <laughs> given the fact that I eventually became a public health advisor in comp cancer, my attitude soon changed. But I think um, as a public health advisor, some of the things that we had to deal with um, is we had to very c clearly define and articulate what comprehensive cancer control was and how this could be of benefit to the to the um, state and about the um, uh, power of partnerships and the messages that we could give um, the state in, in helping reduce the burden of, of cancer. So um, that, that was a little difficult because we did meet some resistance um, with some major people that we brought to the table, some of our influencers, and it took a while to get buy-in from them. But once we had buy-in, we found that, found that they would basically be our champions, and we still have champions in Iowa today who were people that did not initially want to even talk about comprehensive cancer control. I think one of the other challenges that probably at times, not even probably, but that is at times still a challenge is, um, and I'm speaking from the federal seat, but I know that you experienced the same thing at the state level, is if you're the funder, then folks really do think you have all the money to do all the activities. And, and I think that that's especially true because what, we're, what we are used to in the breast and cervical program is we, are, we were used to people, you know, to receiving federal funding to help pay for screening services. And, um, and to really make that argument and convince people that, you know, we are here to help support um, the activities provide an infrastructure, and I know that's not one of our, our words right now, but, <laughs> um, but okay, but we're here to provide the infrastructure so that we can come together and we can leverage what we all have to do this together. And that's a really hard thing for other people when you're trying to invite people to the table to really grasp is, you know, is that there's not, there's not this pot of gold that we have. There's not all this money, but we do have the value of each other. And that to me is much more valuable. And just to add on to that, the term seed money was used quite a bit because there was a little bit of funding to support um, the comprehensive cancer control efforts. But as you said, uh, Nikki, there wasn't full funding. And so that was an issue also that we had to deal with in trying to gain buy-in. So just one, just one last comment is that we are also live in a culture where we treat things, we don't prevent things. And that really, I think, is a very large, huge, overarching goal of the challenge that we have. Because we, we treat diseases, we don't prevent them. You mentioned we treat diseases, we don't prevent them. Uh, I am a, I'm a, a, a podcast junkie right now. I mentioned I'm turning 44 tomorrow. So survival <laughs> and long-term longevity is high on my list. 
And so we do, we do a lot of sitting, we do a lot of eating, we do a lot of drinking, and we do a lot of that and not much else sometimes. Where are we falling, and we, we kind of touched on this a little bit, where are we falling painfully short in terms of, of longevity and health and cancer risk? So I would say what you said is all of the above. We sit too much, we drink too much, we eat not quite the right kinds of foods, um, those types of things. But I think we've heard this several times in the room, and I said this yesterday to the group. Um, I read a story in one of my throwaway journals, you know, I get all this stuff in the mail, about a, a lady who was a master's trained nurse who was overweight. And her doctor had tried to get her to lose weight for 15 years, right? And she was diagnosed with breast cancer. But she didn't fully understand the obesity link to breast cancer until she was diagnosed with breast cancer. So my thing is, for us at CDC, where I work in our division, where are we missing the point with um, the messages that we give out? Someone said that, you know, we need news, and the new in the news, but, you know, one of Tom Frieden's most uh, memorable quotes for me, and I wrote this down and I have it, ever use it when I can, is it doesn't have to be new, it just has to be important. And can I jump in real fast? Please and, do. And I want to say that, I mean, because you are so right when it comes to that. Because you, we talked about the, the, the studies and the surveys we put out there, and, and they don't really make much sense or have much grit to them. If every time you talk to a member of the media, if you say, and this is why this is important, that is the part I guarantee you will get through. So the classic line at the end is, Dr. Richardson, what is it you want me to take away when, you know, when I'm done and go back and write the story or, or splice this thing up you know, for, for TV or radio? And it really is, you have the power to prevent cancer in your hands, right? Now, I agree with the, the problem that we have with environments that are not friendly for walking and that kind of stuff, but, you know, and that gets at the underlying social determinants of health. We got to have walkable streets, right? Atlanta does not have walkable streets. Who said that? No, we don't. But anyway, <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, we specifically... Not in all neighborhoods. I mean, but not in all not, neighborhoods, yeah. but we move specifically to the neighborhood we live in because it has sidewalks, right? So, I mean, you know, but you have to be thinking ahead that way. But, but there are things that we can do. And how do we transmit that? I mean, just walking up and down stairs is, you know, it's exercise. And I think the exercise thing is what throws people off. Somebody said, it's physical activity, Lisa. I'm like, yeah. And I think that um, we have 20 years of that history and that experience um, right here in the room. So if I had to say um, anything, it would be please just keep doing what you're doing because it is making a difference. Um, you know, and, 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 and when you see, when we see relationships like um, Live Strong at the Y, when we see relationships where ACS and CDC and NCI are working together to get things done, um, that's because we all agree that it's important and we've all committed to it. And, and, and so I just say, let's just keep pushing. Let's just keep pushing because it is making a difference. Um, we have a, a long ways to go, but we've come a long way. I'm having seen your brain, you might need to repeat the question. <laughs> where, where are we falling woefully short? Thank you. Um, I had an answer and I couldn't figure out what it was an answer to. Um, I was like, I'm about to say this, but I don't know that it matters. Um, so I would offer the, it is late, um, we are falling woefully short in valuing health. And so even as we're having this conversation about comprehensive cancer control, and I'm currently working on the Million Hearts Initiative in preventing cardiovascular heart disease, um, as a nation, our ability to value health um, and our um, funding that comes to us separately, so there's cancer funding and heart disease funding, and the amount of funding that actually is for the health kind of things. Um, I think the obesity and physical activity is the smallest funded branch uh, division within um, uh, the chronic diseases. So just as a nation, we really aren't valuing health. And then I would offer, um, and I think this is true not just about health, it's just true in general, there is so much information out there 
that the ability to ever have some of the key messages get out, I, I just, I, I almost don't know how we do it um, today, and we really need to look to people like yourself to help make it um, not the sensational news, but the important news. That if you are 44 and you'd like to still be around when you're 64, 74, 84, there are some things that sh that need to happen. Um, that doesn't make it um, to the news very often, regardless of I think how we package it. So the only thing I would add in terms of, and I can't speak for ca comprehensive cancer either. I have not been in this program for a very, very long time. But I think just in, from public health standpoint, um, I do think, and you've probably heard this statement before, you know, your zip code matters. And your zip code shouldn't matter. And you can have one zip code right next to another zip code, and the zip code does matter. And we all know that. So that's not the news. It's what are we going to do about it, and how are we going to start to take that reality very seriously. Um, you know, the mention of um, historic trauma, community level trauma, and how those, how those, you know, the, 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 um, the dynamics in communities, again, that really do not allow for there to be the prioritization. And then again, it's political will too, right? So those, we have a lot of communities in, in this country that are still easily sort of looked beyond or or dismissed and and that's just still becomes a problem so we we have to always go back to our core public health roots which i think are using data and using data to to start to paint the picture of what the reality is in these communities and then to get that to our colleagues and friends in the news or wherever and we don't do even in tobacco we don't do nearly the same amount of what i would call just gritty in the community advocacy work that we used to do. And we, we used to do it because we didn't have resources. <laughs> so we used to, that was what we could do is get a bunch of people together and show up and, and actually, you know, mobilize around something. And when, with resources, sometimes comes professionalism and um, everybody gets really busy on their study or their next, you know, report that they need to write. And we forget to kind of get out there and get involved and, and get in, into actual communities where they're, they're experiencing the burden of these conditions. And I think we, we still all need to learn a lot more about what that, if, without like, hundreds and millions and millions and gazillions of dollars, we all have to figure out how we do a better job of doing that. And I think we, in all across public health, we still have a lot of work to do. Well, ditto, 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 ditto. <laughs> Um, and and I uh, want to just build upon what Nikki said. You know, I don't get discouraged. I know when I was a public health advisor, we had days when when it just seemed like we weren't making any inroads whatsoever, um, but but we were. So one of the things that I, we always try to remind the coalitions is, even though this that might be just a small step, celebrate those successes that you do have. And I know that's not exactly the answer to the question, but I need to think of something besides what my colleagues said. No, no, no. <laughs> It, it is good, and you know we talked about the one thing that that we're working on. At I work at the uh, ABC affiliate here in Atlanta, and the one thing we talk about uh, a lot lately is the value to the story, and and really like what value does this bring? You know, we, we yes we have a we, yes we have a car crash here. Who is that really impacting? You know, I mean, um, you know, yes we have this new study. It's a, a a British and Finnish study about chocolate and wine and and cancer rates, you know, I mean, really, you know, what is that? And so by having these kind of conversations, it's great for me to take it back. And the next time one of those stories comes up, I'll say, well, you know, you know, what really is this? And, and, and is this what we know to be true? And so it's great to have these kind of conversations. And remember, the important thing is, what do you want me to take away from this? You know, break it down into that point that you cannot miss and everybody will get the message. Now, over time, how has the CDC and the program evolved with the, with the national cancer priorities? And, and do, they, do they always coincide, or? Um... Well, I'll start, and then I'll let Lisa um, um, expand. I, I think over time, what we have learned is at CDC, we have learned, <laughs> and this is kind of embarrassing, but well, we have learned to do what we're asking you to do. <laughs> so we have really started over the last few years working very hard 
towards really collaborating. And when we say collaborating, we mean more than just saying, oh yeah, I do talk to Judy because her office is on the next floor. Um, but we have, we have really put teeth behind that. So we have put teeth in collaborative um, funding opportunities. We've put teeth in collaborative opportunities to provide training. We've put teeth in our FOA messages or NOFO messages now um, that really um, open the door to give you opportunities to do that work that we keep saying do when we ask you to collaborate. Um, because, you know, we have a lot of common risk factors and, and so we don't want you to work in silos. And so we've done work internally to try to make sure that we, we, we create those opportunities for collaboration and we encourage that as broadly as we can and still be responsible to our funding line questions that we have to answer to as well. Well, I would say, and actually Nikki's absolutely correct about that. It's, um, but you may notice in the last grant, um, applic oh, excuse me, notice or whatever, the NOFO. <laughs> they, the names change so much I can't keep up. But anyway, you know, when, when we were challenged by our center to say, you know, are you collaboration and writing it into grants and stuff? I'm like, but you guys do that all the time. We just don't ask you to tell us what that is so we can tell the people above us. And like I said uh, yesterday, communicating is up and down and sideways, right? And so what you give us, we communicate up. But to, to um, Fred's question about uh, priorities, you know, there are multiple sets of priorities out there around cancer control, the chronic disease indicators, um, the Healthy People 2020, we could just go on and on. It, um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has a set of things in the county health rankings, so it, it, it's endless. Um, it, well, it feels endless. So I think one thing that's going to help us, one thing um, I was specifically asked to mention that's been mentioned multiple times today, is the national strategy. I think that's really where um, one of the charges we gave the committee was, you know, there are a lot of measures out there. How can you sort of harmonize some of those? How can you put them together? How can you give us like one, can you give us like one path to go down instead of multiple paths? So um, that I am hopeful, as was said earlier, that we'll get something um, that we can actually use out of that. Um, but as far as priorities are concerned, it's, it's all about risk factor reduction, I think, um, because that's where the action is and that's where you're going to get the biggest bang for the buck. I don't work in cancer, like I said, anymore necessarily directly. I mean, it's a major contributing risk factor I do, but um, I will say that I think, um, and the, there's, been a, there's been some discussion today about the, what I would call sort of the continuum, so from the you know, prevention to the survivorship you know, so that whole continuum of a, of a cancer, the potential for, you know, preventing cancer from the beginning to having a diagnosis to that or, or screening to then diagnose to that, to then survivorship for those that are, um, and I, and I do think that from a tobacco perspective anyway, we can be, we could be talking about the relationship of tobacco in all of those phases of that work. And so I think we have tended to, talk about either just you shouldn't start smoking, which is great because you shouldn't start smoking because that'll help prevent tobacco. I mean, excuse me, prevent cancer. And, and that's everybody knows that. But we don't talk nearly enough about what somebody said earlier about if you if you're receiving chemotherapy and you or any if you're if, you know, people who suffer from behavioral health issues and they and they, there are major counterindications between medications that people are on for other issues and then the nicotine exposure because of their smoking. And we don't talk about those things a lot. So I think there's, from the standpoint of aligning federal and, and national agendas, I think there's probably places where we could align better across that continuum, even with the risk factor. So we're not thinking about just the risk factor for the prevention, but across that entire continuum. In the um, 20 years, so what's next for the program? Where do, we, where, where do we see things going? Where do they need to go? Are there any emerging trends or opportunities that are on the horizon out there? It's all of our questions. <laughs> as, um, so, as, as you may have noticed, I, I've spread them around a little bit. <laughs> um, so 
I think um, where we need to go, um, we, we certainly need to continue to press the efforts around risk reduction. Um, I do think that with this growing population of cancer survivors, we need to continue to invest in, in, in what we can do to impact the quality of life for cancer survivors. Um, we need to invest more in how do we better understand those experiences and then what can we do to support them. And then um, I think that we just, we just need to keep pushing, just keep pushing. So as Nikki just said, I, you know, I completely agree. And so if you were to ask me now, what's the takeaway? from what we're doing. Somebody has actually said it multiple times in different ways, but we went through a planning process about, oh gosh, I've been here four years, it's hard to believe, three years ago as director, and you know, there were, how do you distill your stuff down to like three words that people can remember, right? So really what we do is prevention, screening, and survivors. Those are the three areas, those are the things that was just said. And no matter what you do with those three things, almost every single thing we do in public health impacts prevention, screening, and survival from cancer. And so it really is about, and as Nikki said, I love my job, I've been here almost 20 years, and people are like, you have? They haven't beat the life out of you yet? And I'm like, oh, good Lord, no. And so what I learned from one of my little fellows, not my little fellow, he's bigger than me, but a young man that works for me, is that he said he went to this, um, he went to this class, and this is what he learned. I get to come to work at CDC. I, you get to go to work at WSB too, right? And I, yes. you, Exactly. You don't have to go there, but you get to go there, and you get to do a job where you think you're actually making a difference in people's lives right? Telling me where don't go down 285 North because it's not going to be good for you. Don't Don't do it. it. (laughs) Are you hit to the traffic guy? Traffic man, tell her where to go. But I'm just saying, but it, it really is about we get to come to wherever it is we work and we get to do cancer control and we get to make a difference in the world and people's lives. So that's why I'm excited. And that really is the future. Nikki is right. No matter how, it's, it's like the little, uh, you know, that little clown thing with the ball in his butt, you know, not in his butt, but in his bottom. And you hit the clown and he just falls down and he pops right back up like a weeble, right? Weebles wobble, right? So we get knocked down and we get right back up. You know what I mean, right? Anyway. <laughs> It's late. I apologize. <laughs> I, but I, I did find but what you're talking about. I got it now. Exactly I got about, it. Right? <laughs> Bozo the clown, right? But anyway, but, you know, we're not Bozo. But I think that we just have to keep top of mind that we are working for something that's bigger than us. And, um, you know, the goal really is, I think, you know, in sight, even given the challenges that we have here and, you know, outside of CDC. And I, I really forget, if I could just add one more thing. To Armin's point, um, we will never achieve our goals around cancer prevention and control if we don't continue to pay special attention to the disparities that we see. Um, and I was just having a conversation that, you know, we were having these disparities conversations 20 years ago. We're still having these conversations now. And to me, that's every indication that there is absolutely work to be done. And so we need to continue to focus and not get discouraged, um, especially by all of the things that we see going on around us. And not speaking for cancer, I can't at all talk about what the emerging trends are, but I, listening to this and even just the opportunity, and thank you very much for letting somebody who was around a while ago come back and had, felt like I had a small role. Um, as far as opportunities, it, first I want to congratulate you on 20 years of comprehensive cancer control. It really is amazing to think that um, it still is there and that you all are working on it. Um, and as I'm listening, it just feels like it's still sort of the same thing. Listen, learn from the field. Um, you all learn from each other um, and lean in. You know, where are the opportunities today? Um, lean in. It feels like I would say those things that started comprehensive cancer control are still absolutely true today, um, and I see those as the biggest opportunities. The only thing I would add to what's already been said is, and I, and I can't say, this is what I would hope we would see something different in the next 20 years. I can't say whether it's going to be the way or not, but I mean, just think about where we sit right now with the the explosion of technology and the explosion, uh, you know, and the changes in the way that we relate to, reach, and engage people, 
right? And even if it is about ultimately, and I am a complete firm believer that it is ultimately about changing the context that supports people, it is ultimately about people. And it's ultimately about the people who are you know, making decisions each and every day. So the more we can, I would hope for the next 20 years in this area and in lots and lots of other areas that we get as sophisticated as we can, as quickly as we can with how to most effectively use technology to really advance our, our interests. Because we do have, you know, lots of problems with, you know, lots of very remote areas. We're, I mean, we're, and, we're, and like I said, there's just, there's not enough money in the world to, to, to just, say that it's it's all about money. It's got to be about using the assets and the resources and, and the technology that we have as a country to really start to address some of these really um, challenging problems. So that's what I would hope for the next 20 years. Well, I would never presume to say <laughs> what's next for the um, Comp Cancer Program or, or the division, but I think we really need to continue to look at uh, the lessons learned and what works, and especially around those very strong partnerships and how, how we can work with coalitions to help you move through that Heimelman um, uh, hierarchy of partnerships, um, you know, to go beyond communication, cooperation, coordination, and truly get to that collabor collaboration. And I also think um, Judy mentioned the importance of listening to what are the needs from the coalitions, what are the needs of the field, and then design technical assistance and training around those needs so that we can help expand the organizational capacity of coalitions and um, enhance the competencies of the great uh, people that do work out in the field. Um, and especially those competencies around um, evidence-based intervention and policy systems and environmental changes. What, uh, what struck me as interesting here, and so much of it, but one part was that um, these are real people we're talking about. So it was, I think it was 2005, and I had a very, in my opinion, a very rough day at work. Right, so I come home and you know my my story wasn't on on time or something, or somebody didn't talk to me who I thought was supposed to talk to me, and and you know I was working with my photographer and we, we miscommunicated on what I wanted in the story, and so I come home and my wife is sitting there, and and I tell her about my horrible day, and she sits there and she looks at me, and she and she just listens to my story as I complain about absolutely nothing. Right, and I finished talking, and she turns to me with the most pleasant expression on her face, as much as she could muster, and she says, I was diagnosed with cancer today. I always think back to that about it. These are people we're talking about. Not numbers, not statistics, real people. Her name is Paige Blankenship. Um, I'm going to leave this one question, and it can be brief, your answer. When I say cancer and your hopes and dreams for the future, what do you think, doctor? Hopes and dreams. Well, I, I will start out with the antithesis of what was said earlier. <laughs> I hate the impact of, that cancer has on people's lives, but you have to acknowledge the thing that you're trying to deal with. So I don't hate cancer. That's why I became an oncologist, because cancer is one of those, and when, you, when your wife told you that, it's one of those, um, I can't remember the word for it, it's late, but the meeting moment where everybody understands what, what we have to do. Um, and so that's why I became an oncologist. When I tell people they have cancer, they go, okay, Dr. Richardson, what are we going to do? And so that's the challenge for me as, you know, what, what my hope is for the future is that we can have fewer and fewer of those conversations. Um, my hope is that when you say cancer, people have to sit there and think for a hard minute and try to remember what, what is that because we've come just that far. That's exactly what I was going to say. Cancer what? And I would just add, and that would be for all people in all communities. And in our very first cancer plan, when I was a public health advisor, it started out um, with, with a sentence that said, um, so many people in the uh, state of Iowa will hear the words, you have cancer. And so I hope those numbers really decrease in the future. Thank you very much. A round of applause, please, for our CDC staff panel.
Dr. Lisa Richardson, Nikki Hayes, Judy Hannon, Corinne Grafunder, and Lori Graff. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great conversation and enthusiasm. Who's in the room here? Do, can I just go forward, Kelsey? Okay. All right. Um, on behalf of our division, I want to say thanks to everyone. Thanks to Fred for, um, okay, L let me deal with the little forgive me thing. <laughs> so trying to be um, hip with my kids, I have a bitmoji, that's me. And uh, I heard some laughter out there. Mm -hmm. I don't have as much hair as I used to have. It's not just guys that lose their hair. But anyway, um, but yesterday, I made the comment uh, that you guys didn't know what our data visualization was. And then I realized, and someone came up to me later, and I realized I was talking to myself again. <laughs> so, you know, I'm sure all of you guys have seen this in our data mapping tool. It's where you can go and map data, cancer incidence and mortality in your state that was, you know, developed by our division for the U.S. Cancer Statistics. So I just wanted to say I'm sorry. I used the wrong words. It's all about context. It's all about how we get things um, moving and understanding on the same page. Um, next. And so this, again, is really, this was something that I created at the end of our cancer conference last year, but it is quite relevant for today. Everything we talked about today is about the personal touch. It's about the individual. It's about relationships. The two uh, awardees that we heard is about being inspired. It's about creativity and the work that they did to get those things done. It was about their, um, this, is, this is my, um, what is it? This is what I do in my free time. And I'm sure both of them did the work that they did in their free time. Um, but again, it's about prevention, it's about screening, and it's about survivors. And as long as we can stay focused, and that was the other thing that I could have said earlier as well, it is really about staying focused on a goal. Stop getting mission creep in the work you're doing. When you start talking to people, they'll start saying, well, why can't we so, and why, and why, and why? Well, you know, you'll just have to say, be very polite and say, you know, that's a wonderful idea, but that's not why we came to the meeting today. We came today to talk about X and to just remain focused on that. But again, I want to thank all of you guys for coming. Give yourselves a hand for staying. <laughs> Till the end. <laughs> I want to thank Mr. Blankenship for talking to us. Fred, thanks for coming and being, <laughs> being the energy in the room. We have a reception outside, and I wanted to thank the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors, John Robisher and Frank Bright, for providing that. Um, and as I said, all the staff that helped plan it, you, can't, you know, can't do something like this. And just remember, the one thing that I said earlier is you get to come to work and do cancer control, and we should all be extremely excited about that. Thank you. <laughs>